Can I welcome everyone to the 25th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2018 and remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as meeting papers are provided in digit format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. No apologies have been received. For this item, the committee is invited to consider whether to take consideration of its work programme at Agenda Item 4 in private and are we all agreed? Agenda item two is subordinate <coughs> legislation and the committee will consider negative instrument 196 as listed on the agenda. The instrument is laid under the negative procedure, which means that its provisions will come into force unless the Parliament votes on motions to annul it. No motions to annul have been laid. The Delegated Power and Law Reform Committee has not drawn the instrument to the Parliament's attention on any of its reporting grounds. Do members have any comments on the instrument? Okay. In that case, I invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument. And are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you. The next item of business, we will suspend for a minute to allow the minister and officials to come to the table. This is day two of stage two of the planning bill and I welcome the Minister for Local Government and Housing, Kevin Stewart, and his accompanying officials to today's meeting. A number of MPs who are not committee members but have lodged amendments to the bill will again also be in attendance today and are very welcome. Uh, I'll go straight on to the call and amendment 171 in the name of Andy Whiteman in a group on its own. Andy Whiteman to move and speak to amendment 171. Uh, thank you very much, um, convener. I move Amendment 171 in my name. In evidence to the Local Government Committee on the 23rd of May uh, this year, Julie Proctor from Greenpeace Scotland said, and I quote, at one point local authorities were required to produce open place strategies, so many local authorities have them, but they are coming up for renewal. At the moment, the wording is that they should have them, so there is something to be done there with the committee scrutiny of the Planning Scotland Bill to ensure that local authorities have an open space strategy. It's not just about parks, it's about green network strategy that takes a green infrastructure perspective. The uh, Scottish Planning Advice Note 65 deals with planning and open space and was published in 2008, over a decade ago. It's a good document, and it will in accordance with the provisions of the bill, be incorporated into the national planning framework and become part of the development plan. Key elements in Pan 6.5 are a strategic vision and framework, an audit of open space, an assessment of current and future requirements, and a strategic statement. Uh, currently, only nine out of Scotland's local authorities have an open space strategy that is current. Of the remaining 23, 12 are reviewing or revising strategies, and most of the remaining 11 have some sort of alternative in place including commitments in the local development plan. So this element of Scottish planning policy is now well established, understood uh, and implemented. My amendment builds on the good work undertaken to date across Scotland by making such open space strategies a statutory requirement for all planning authorities with the exception of national park authorities, in other words, just for all of Scotland's 32 local authorities. Convener, this is a modest reform designed to elevate current best practice in Scottish planning policy to the level of a statutory requirement so as to ensure that the good work that's been carried out to date continues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anybody else have any other comment? Minister? Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, the government recognises the value of open space and that being able to access high quality green space can improve people's health, well-being and confidence. Indeed, we introduced a national indicator on improving access to local green space in 2016. Um, but I don't believe it's necessary to impose duties and authorities about preparing open space strategies. Uh, the most recent State of Scotland's Green Space report uh, confirms all councils have some recognised form of spatial plan relating to green space and open space. And that is, that is without uh, it being a statutory duty on local authorities. Uh, can I, can I move on a, a wee bit and I'll, I'll take Mr Simpson in if that's okay with you, convener? In fact, just take Mr Simpson in now. 
Uh, appreciate that. Thanks very much. Um, so you heard Andy Whiteman say that uh, most Scottish councils do not have an up-to-date um, op open space uh, plan. Um, do you not think that this amendment would help to rectify that? Um, as I've just said, all councils have some recognised form of spatial plan uh, relating to green space and open space. If I can move back, um, the audit that would be required by this amendment is very detailed uh, and would place a, a financial burden on authorities. Uh, the Scottish Government works with local authorities in various ways uh, to achieve our shared priorities. And I do not believe that statutory duties are always the most appropriate mechanism. Uh, getting into the detail of the wording of Amendment 171, I have a number of concerns. Um, it defines the terms open space, green networks and green infrastructure. Uh, the Scottish Government has already established definitions for these in Scottish planning policy, which was subject to extensive consultation. Uh, the amendment defines some of those terms differently, uh, and it is not clear why they are different or whether the changes were subject to a similar level of engagement. Uh, keeping such definitions in national policy rather than in legislation allows them to uh, um, evolve to reflect emerging policy. For example, uh, the National Indicator on Access to Local Green Space now also looks at blue space, uh, such as beaches uh, and walkways beside rivers or canals. That may be an aspect we would look to incorporate when we review national planning policy, as other types of outdoor spaces that people can enjoy. My view is that open space should be an integral part of a development plan spatial strategy and that authorities should choose whether and when a so separate document is needed. Um, and I would ask the committee to reject this amendment. Thank you. And the Whiteman to wind up. Um, thank you very much, um, convener. Um, I mean, the minister's correct that um, all authorities have some sort of open space plan in its loosest sense uh, and many of these are integrated into the local development plan um, however the and i agree with the minister that we shouldn't be imposing statutory duties that are strictly not uh, required i take the view however that given the good work that's been done uh, to date um, that it shouldn't be overly onerous on planning authorities to prepare an open space strategy i take the minister's um, remarks in regard to uh, language and particularly in terms of, of definitions and I'm very happy to um, consider further amendments at stage three that perhaps would um, simplify uh, the, requir the statutory requirement here and provide more flexibility. I will take uh, an intervention. If I could just finish that point, that happy to consider an amendment that would incorporate such a duty but uh, in, 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 in tandem with, with guidance, which would allow that duty to be, to be um, implemented in a more flexible way. Happy to give way. Um, thank you, and thank you, convener. Um, Mr Whiteman said that he doesn't believe that uh, adding this in would be overly onerous on local authorities. Um, can I ask um, what consultation Mr Whiteman has undertaken with local authorities to see um, exactly how onerous they think that this would be? I've had this informal discussions with a couple of local authorities. I've asked no questions about the degree of onerousness um, that this would incorporate. Um, I've had no um, kickback uh, on this. Um, I, I, uh, I would say that the views I've had were fairly neutral on whether this should be a statutory duty uh, or not. But uh, as I said in my uh, early remarks, I'm very happy to consider amending this further at stage three um, in discussions with the Minister to make sure that this is not an overly onerous uh, duty. But the important thing that it does, the important thing that it does, is that whilst local authorities are doing some good work just now, there's no guarantee that that will continue. Placing this on the face of the bill ensures that all planning authorities will have something that we can call an open space strategy. Thank you. Okay, and can I ask, will we be pressing on withdrawing? I'll press the amendment, thank you. The question therefore is that Amendment 171 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay. Uh, could the, those who are in favour raise their hands? And those opposed? Those three in favour. Okay, thank you. The amendment's passed.
I call Amendment 188 in the name of Alexander Stewart, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Alexander Stewart to move Amendment 188 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. Happy to move Amendment 188. Uh, as we are aware, the, the challenges facing uh, demographics in Scotland and our ageing population are significant. Uh, and we are aware that the population of our uh, older individuals will increase dramatically uh, during the, uh, the time between 2012 and 2038. Some projections have indicated that we have 59% increase in the over 65s. Uh, these factors underline the need to invest in housing for older people. And to address this, I believe that the investment in housing will save resources, which would otherwise have been spent on health and social care. To tackle this, it, it also looks at loneliness, isolation, uh, which are becoming even more profound in our ageing population. Addressing these issues will require strategic action at the national level through the national planning framework and will also at the local development plan and local place plans. I am therefore calling on the Scottish Executive and the Scottish Government uh, uh, and members of the committee to uh, accept the amendment which I have put forward uh, addressing the need for older people uh, because I do believe that the amendment will place a duty on the Scottish Ministers to lay a report before the Scottish Parliament every two years and the housing need for older people and the progress that we made towards meeting these needs. Uh, I put forward this in my name. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much, Mr Short. Kenneth Gibson to move Amendment 188A and speak to all amendments in the group. Hey, thank you, convener. And uh, my amendments are simply to add the words and disabled people throughout this amendment where older people are uh, previously mentioned. And therefore supportive of Amendment 188, which I believe is proportionate given the rising numbers of uh, older people and people who, with disabilities uh, 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 and our, in our society and their specific needs. I think it's also important, this is in primary legislation, to ensure that older people and disabled people are fully uh, considered. And I believe that uh, this amendment, that, that these amendments and indeed Amendment 188 are consistent with what the committee agreed at, uh, uh, in, with regard to uh, the national planning framework. Thank you. Uh, Annabelle, you wanted to come in? Yes, I do. Come here. Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I understand where these amendments are coming from, and I have um, some sympathy, particularly focusing on the issues of, of uh, the interests of disabled people. I speak as a former deputy convener of the cross-party group on disability. However, looking at the issue from the perspective of planning law, I mean, presumably, if you were in some other group, you could argue that you had particular needs that deserved particular uh, treatment uh, singled out in the, the, the legislation. For example, what about the position of veterans? For example, in terms of societal changes, what about the position of lone parents who uh, need particular accommodation if they have uh, custody uh, uh, residence orders with regard to their children? What about the position in terms of societal changes of fathers who don't have residence vis-a-vis -vis their children but have uh, contact rights and need, therefore, appropriate accommodation in order to be able to get, for example, overnight access. Many fathers can't get that because they don't have suitable accommodation. So all I'm saying is, if you look across the piece, there are many different kinds of needs of, of people vis-a-vis -vis the, the planning system and vis-a-vis -vis housing need. And I would have thought that surely the expectation of everybody is that they feel that they should be treated equally under planning law. So I would have concerns. Uh, about these amendments, convener. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Anybody else? Right? Okay, Minister. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, as I uh, said last week, and in, in relation to similar amendments, um, th the support for the housing needs of older and disabled people is a laudable aim, and I have no objection whatsoever to reporting on progress where the requirements are flexible. Uh, and would provide robust, meaningful and actionable evidence. As I already explained, the Scottish Government already maintains an online action programme for National Planning Framework 3, uh, which is updated at least once a year. However, I've also made it clear um, that I don't believe it is proportionate to single out housing for older people and disabled people in this way in primary legislation, separate from uh, other housing needs, as uh, Ms Ewing has, has mentioned. Uh, the planning system on its own cannot ensure that particular types of housing are delivered. Housing services and market conditions also have a significant part to play, to name but two. The planning system certainly 
uh, cannot ensure that houses are adapted for old, older people or disabled people, since adaptations often do not require planning permission. Indeed, planning for, funding and implementing adaptations is within the remit of health and social care partnerships, uh, working with housing authorities and not planning authorities. This is a critical point, um, and I would ask the committee to bear in mind the scope of planning and its limitations. Whilst planning can estimate future needs for particular types of homes, it cannot assess the specific needs of individuals or households and decide on the uh, type of housing required to meet their needs or ensure that properties are allocated to those who will need it. Uh, local housing strategies are much better placed to play a direct influencing role uh, in this regard. As well as going beyond the scope of planning, uh, the report suggested in Amendment 188 uh, would be an onerous task to prepare, and it is not clear what it would actually achieve. It would probably be possible to compile a report detailing new build completions specifically for older uh, people, or for example, those, who, uh, those houses that are wheelchair accessible. However, it would not be possible to fully evaluate how well those homes are meeting the needs of their occupants in a meaningful way at a national level. We cannot simply draw from local information either. Based on research we have recently undertaken, um, I have concerns about how locally derived information from housing land audits could be aggregated into a robust evidence-based document at a national level. The frequency of reporting that would be required is also disproportionate, given that on average, homes take around 18 months from planning to completion. I appreciate that these amendments are very well intentioned, uh, but they are fraught with technical difficulty and complexity, and they go beyond the scope of the planning system. In any case, Rather than creating an unwieldy and resource-intensive monitoring system, I believe that time would be better used in supporting the delivery of housing on the ground. I would ask Mr Stewart not to press Amendment 188 and for Mr Gibson not to move Amendments 188A to L. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Alexander Stewart to wind up on Amendment 188. Thank you, Convener. <coughs> And I, I, I note the Minister's comments, uh, but I am surprised uh, and also a little distressed that, you know, you've gone into such detail, Minister, indicating that you do not believe that this is appropriate or that you feel that this is going to be a burden. We should be supporting... We should be supporting... I have not said that doing this kind of work is not appro appropriate. It just doesn't fit in with planning, and I believe that what is asked for in the amendment is disproportionate. Okay, thank you. As I say, I mean, I note the minister's comments, but I do not believe they are disproportionate. Uh, I think it's important that we uh, indicate that we do support uh, our growing ageing population. Uh, and the, the, the areas that the minister has covered in indicating that uh, there would be a requirement to ensure every care plan, every individual who has a, a, a package that's been put in, they understand their, their, their carers, their organisations that are supporting them understand the needs they require in housing. Uh, that is taken in, in part of their care package. Uh, so it's, I do not believe that it would be onerous to ensure that we would have some kind of review and have some kind of statutory indication as to what would take place and could take place. And it's vitally important that we do think long and hard about what we are trying to achieve here. So I am disappointed, uh, convener, that the minister has indicated. Well, are, well, are you happy to take an intervention? Yes. Um, I, I don't disagree with uh, Mr Stewart on many of the points that he's making in terms of getting it right for people across the country in terms of housing and care needs. Uh, my difficulty in all of this is where it fits in with the planning system. Um, and I, as I've outlined, um, I think that what Mr Stewart is putting forward is very, very onerous um, and will add to the burden of not only authorities, um, but also officials here. I think that what he is trying to achieve, as I've said, is laudable. I think that would be much better done in terms of housing and care services rather than through planning legislation. Mr Stewart. 
as I say, Convener, you know, the, uh, the Minister makes points, and, and but I am still quite adamant that I believe that these should uh, be. Stuart, take this. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Can I thank Mr. Stewart for taking an intervention? Um, I think the point he's making uh, it is very well made, and Kenneth Gibson made the, made the same point. This is uh, not a disproportionate uh, set of amendments. Um, surely um, we should be planning for older people, uh, and that is surely part of the planning system. Would uh, Perhaps Mr Stewart would agree with that. Yes. I, I would completely concur with that, that we should be planning, because the situations we find ourselves in some parts of the country where it has obviously not uh, worked well, uh, and there is now crises in number of situations in, in local authorities and regions of Scotland, because that has not been the case. So I think that by giving this opportunity, by actually taking this forward, it would give us the, the chance to plan and give us the opportunity to secure uh, residences for individuals who are of an older nature and who have disabilities. And it's only right and proper that we should attempt to do that on their behalf. And we have the opportunity during this planning bill to achieve that. Uh, no, uh, sorry, you, you should have intervened on him. Kenny's going to speak to Kenneth Gibson. I'll now speak to Amendment 188A. Yeah. Well, but, um, yeah. I, I just agree with what, what actually has been said there by uh, Alexander. I think I understand the Minister's perspective, but it's not actually happening as it perhaps should be happening at this time. And the whole point uh, of this, and we mentioned it last week, is to have a belt and braces approach to make sure that these groups, older people and people with disabilities are considered. And I think there's a difference between someone, uh, one of the groups that Annabelle Ewing mentioned, who do not necessarily need a house to be designed specifically for them because they have a different kind of uh, issue to face. And I think what we're talking about here is houses that uh, for older people and people who are disabled, perhaps dementia-friendly houses, houses that are built with adaptations rather than those who have to have adaptations subsequently added uh, uh, to them. So I think that this is a, a fairly measured yeah, amendment. And Gibson will take an of intervention. Course, of course. Um, I thank Mr Gibson for taking the intervention. And, um, you know, I think that one of the key things in terms of getting it right for older and disabled people in the future um, is making changes to local housing strategy guidance, which the government is embarking on at this moment. And I hope to have that report back in December. I think that um, I understand exactly where um, folks are coming from in, in some regards, but this is not a matter for the planning system. Uh, the vast bulk of, of people um, who are in homes who um, may develop illness or who age, um, we know, want to stay in the homes that they're in. Uh, and that requires adaptation, which, as I've already mentioned, would not be captured adaptation of existing homes, which would not be captured in all of this. And while, you know, I can report back in terms of planning aspects um, of, of these kind of homes, what I cannot do, yeah, what I cannot do is force people into a situation to, to build these homes, which I think is the uh, intention of, of some of the things that Mr Stewart and Mr Gibson have, have uh, actually gone on about. Thank you. Uh, Kenneth Gibson. And I'm, I'm said enough, I think, uh, can you? OK, right. In that case, I ask you, Kenneth, to uh, press or withdraw? Uh, I'll press. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 188A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. OK, can th those who agree? Those who are opposed? It's 5-2 in favour of Amendment 188A. Uh, I call amendments 188B to L in the name of Kenneth Gibson and I invite Kenneth to move these on block. On block, convener. Thank you. Does any member have uh, objections to a single vote in these? No, if not then. The question is that amendments 188B to 188L be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. No. It's 5-2 in, in favour of... Can we just take a vote? OK, sorry, but raise your hands. Those, oh, no, you. Five and opposed, two. Thank you. A couple of pages, was And I ask Alexander Stewart to press or withdraw Amendment 188. Press. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 188 be agreed to. 
Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, those who are in favour? Those who are opposed? Thank you. Okay. I call Amendment 220 in the name of Claudia Beamish in a group of its own. Claudia Beamish to move and speak to Amendment 220. Uh, good morning, Convener. Good morning, uh, Minister and colleagues. Um, Amendment 220 looks to set up a low carbon infrastructure commission designed to bring much needed long term focus for low carbon infrastructure in the planning system. The function of the commission would be to identify low carbon infrastructure needs and priorities to make recommendations on how to address these priorities, to issue climate change and low carbon energy efficiency guidance to planning authorities that must be regarded, and to make recommendations in the preparation of other plans and reports. Scottish ministers have the flexibility, if this goes forward, to bring forward further provision about governance <coughs> and membership, and regulations must be brought forward within a year of the Act coming into force. Um, I appreciate this is a complex um, issue, and I have put it all into one amendment in terms of time, because it's a probing amendment to get the feel from the committee and others, um, and of, of course the Minister, as to um, whether it's something that there's an appetite to go forward on, and I'll just explain a little bit more about it. The Commission would also prepare and publish a National Infrastructure Needs Assessment, or NINA, uh, to analyse long-term needs and make recommendations for implementation. And this would undergo consultation by persons who are listed in the amendment. And finally, the Scottish ministers must have regard to the NINA when preparing the National Performance Framework. In my view, there needs to be a more joined-up approach between Scottish Government's climate change ambitions and policies with its capital spending commitments and planning system. High carbon projects threaten to lock us in to a high carbon future that is incompatible with our climate change efforts. And the climate change... Um, uh, and national infrastructure are a vital piece of the puzzle in meeting our ambitions. My aim with this commission would be that it would take the development of infrastructure out of short-term cycles of government and allow ministers to make informed decisions about the country's future in infrastructure requirements in line with zero our zero-carbon future. Failing to make public investments with this agenda in mind would leave a legacy of infrastructure that would be more expensive to adapt in the future through retrofitting. And I note from our Eclair committee of um, recent evidence that at the moment only 29% of um, our large infrastructure projects are actually um, low carbon uh, through the assessment of SPICE. Um, so the establishment of the commission was a recommendation made by the Low Carbon Infrastructure Task Force. So I haven't sort of plucked it out of the air. And it was also supported by WWF Scotland, who've um, given me support. Yes. Can, can I just finish this little point? Yes, please. Um, and it's in line with the government's existing budget commitment to increase low carbon um, infrastructure. Yes. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I mean, a number of parties have uh, sort of similar ideas about setting up uh, various types of uh, infrastructure commissions or bodies. Um, but uh, this is a planning bill, and it seems to me that this isn't the this isn't the place uh, for this. Um, it would cost a lot of money, presumably, to set up. I don't know if you've worked out any any figures, uh, but you know it may be a good idea. But it looks to me that the planning bill is not the place for it. And you've said earlier that this is a probing amendment. Uh, I'm guessing from that you're not intending to uh, move it. Um, but that you know we're here to pass amend pass or reject amendments. Um, would you agree this is this is not the place for it? Well, part of the I thank the member for his intervention, and part of the purpose of stage two is to clarify whether um, this is indeed the place for something, and to highlight that there is a, a serious issue, which, in my view, there is, in terms of it only being 29 percent, um, as I've already highlighted, of infrastructure, and in terms of the national um, planning framework, there infrastructure projects are part of that as I understand it and I appreciate there are other aspects to it but if not here where is is the question I would float in the air for for answer um, as I say it is a probing amendment but a number of respondents highlighted their concern that the draft bill was perhaps uh, not uh, not focused enough on low carbon and I do believe it to be important so if there's an interest I ask the minister 
um, really in a sense following on from um, Graham Simpson's point as well, but which I was going to make. Um, I'll, I'll just say what I, I'm asking the minister, because I'm, the, I'm in the middle of that sentence. Um, I, I asked the minister to clarify, please, how it could be enacted if not here in this planning bill, as it is argued, uh, if it is argued that planning is only part of the puzzle. And this commission would not replace um, any regulator, I stress, but would give an independ independent advice. I've only got a couple of other points, very brief points to make, but I will take your intervention. Well, thank you. I'm grateful to the member. Um, I mean, I do have concerns about costs, creating yet another body and costs, and I, I don't know if the members had the opportunity to consider what the cost would be, because obviously cost money spent on this is less money spent than something else. Uh, that's kind of the way of life. But another issue that's not been raised yet is the question of accountability. I mean, where does this sit in terms of the, the role, uh, let's remember, of uh, local authorities, of the democratically elected local councillors. Where does this sit in terms of, of that process and the very important issue, therefore, of accountability? Right. If, um, in terms of the cost, if there um, is an appetite and interest for it in terms of this bill, I would, I would look more carefully into costs. Um, uh, and, and I haven't looked in any detail into costs at the moment. That's where things are with that. Um, as far as... Um, uh, sorry, can you just remind me? I'm just thinking about well, the... The issue, of, the the issue of accountability, uh, and yes, if we the remember the role of the locally clear elected, role. democratically elected yeah. councillors here. Uh, so. Which would be... Yes, there are, of course, democratically um, elected councillors who, whose role I, I highly respect. Um, it would be um, for ministers, as I said, to set guidance and then for... Um, local authorities to, um, to uh, take that in the context of their own um, decision-making, um, to look at low carbon in, in a more focused way, I would hope. Um, so there's also a broader set of benefits, just lastly, such as energy efficiency and jobs and tackling fuel poverty, and of course, um, in other portfolios, savings to the NHS from um, issues around air quality, which could be improved by more appropriate low carbon infrastructure as well um, with active travel routes. Um, so I'll end there and I'd be very interested to hear what, um, what the Minister says and if there are other comments from members. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. Andy? Uh, thank you very much, Convener, and thank you to Claudia for bringing this amendment. Um, I've got no disagreement with the policy intention behind it. In fact, I think it's quite a critical task that somebody undertakes and that, uh, for example, a recent commission set up, the Scottish Land Commission, has been doing valuable work that cuts across electoral cycles and enables a degree of consistency and depth to policy development that, that will be very, very useful. And so I think a body like this, and indeed a body that could, um, as some have suggested, in fact, a general infrastructure commission, low carbon or not, that sorts some of the conundrums around infrastructure that's required for some of the development we need, uh, is a good idea. Um, but I do have some concerns because this is a planning bill, um, is concerned with the process uh, of planning um, uh, and reporting, ministerial accountability for the planning system, etc. And I'm not convinced it's the place to legislate for new organisations. Um, but I am open to persuasions to how the functions identified in the amendment can be incorporated in a more appropriate way in this bill. And I'd be happy to speak to the member on an ongoing basis uh, around that. Uh, but this would be a departure for any planning legislation back 70 years to 1947, to set up new bodies. Um, planning legislation is designed to provide the framework of rules and processes around which planning authorities exercise their powers under planning law. It has not been to date a place where we, 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 we set up new commissions. Um, so I'm not persuaded this is the correct place, but I'm open to further conversation. OK, thank you very much, uh, Minister. Uh, convener, um, I recognise that infrastructure is a key issue for planning reform. Uh, the Scottish Government has been progressing a programme of work to look at this, uh, focusing mainly on improving practice uh, rather than introducing new stra statutory duties. Uh, the idea of uh, an infrastructure agency or working group was raised by the Independent Planning Review Panel uh, in 2016. Um, we considered this carefully, uh, we consulted on it and discussed it with stakeholders. And I know that there is some support for a new organisation to address infrastructure. And indeed, since then, there have been further requests for new commissions or agencies covering different aspects of infrastructure. However, this in itself will not uh, achieve better alignment of planning um, with infrastructure. 
uh, a new uh, body to address infrastructure could add to an already complex landscape uh, of interests. Uh, it could be costly uh, and, of course, it would take time to set up. Even uh, a small new public body uh, could cost one and a half million to two million uh, per year. Uh, and we do not need to create another organisation. Instead, we do need to focus on better coordination and communication with existing organisations. Uh, certainly, I'll take Mr Beamish, Mr. Beamish convener. Thank you. I'm, I'm listening very carefully to what you're saying, Minister. I'm just wondering, where, how do you see a, a more robust assessment of um, planning development, if not through um, a, an, an independent commission, uh, to make sure that we do move in the way of low carbon? And, and as I made the point, that we're not having to then retrofit um, very big um, uh, projects in the future. Well, if we look at um, last week's um, session, um, the, uh, we agreed Monica Lennon's amendment, which uh, uh, ensures that climate change is fully addressed in the national planning framework. So I think, you know, uh, that is a way that this will um, be dealt with and uh, looking at how uh, we can bring low carbon uh, into play in every aspect of our day to day lives. And beyond that, um, you know, the Parliament very soon will be looking at a new climate change bill, and I'm sure that as we progress through that, um, we will be coming up uh, with other innovative ideas. Um, as part of a, our uh, programme uh, of planning reform, um, the Scottish Government has already um, established uh, an infrastructure delivery group, uh, including both public and private infrastructure providers. Uh, and the approach reflects the fact that there are already many organisations uh, with uh, a responsibility for infrastructure delivery. Uh, many opportunities could be missed uh, if we are distracted uh, by the process of setting up a new commission. Instead, I'm very keen to ensure um, that the next national planning framework aligned with the Scottish Government infrastructure programmes provides a stronger steer on future infrastructure requirements. Uh, and I made this point to the committee last week, and I know there's support for improving that alignment. Uh, we can achieve much more by doing this uh, than we would if we, placed, uh, if we passed on responsibility for infrastructure to a new separate body. Um, our programme for government also commits to a, a new infrastructure mission. Uh, and the First Minister has appointed the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity uh, to highlight the importance of uh, the issue. Uh, a commission whose advisory functions uh, relate primarily to planning authorities and the development and use of land uh, could cut across um, these wider initiatives. Uh, the second part of this amendment introduces a requirement for a national infrastructure needs assessment. Our infrastructure investment plan is the way in which we coordinate infrastructure investment. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity uh, will be considering our approach to ref refreshing the 2015 infrastructure investment plan in due course. And I don't think there's any need um, for a separate assessment to be undertaken. I've continuously emphasised the importance of planning having a stronger focus on delivery throughout the debates that we've had. Uh, and there's clearly a need for development plans to be better informed by fuller evidence on infrastructure capacity and requirements. Our research has said that there is a particular need to do this at a regional um, rather than a national scale. Uh, and we proposed introducing infrastructure audits at a regional scale in our consultation and intend to develop this further in practice as we move towards the next national planning framework. I had also envisaged this as a key area for authorities to address um, in their strategic de development reports uh, working with the Scottish Government had the committee agreed with Amendment 116. Nevertheless, I still want to see planning work more flexibly and effectively uh, with wider regional economic partnerships, uh, working and with um, infrastructure providers to strengthen that delivery. Uh, by aligning planning at this scale uh, with city and growth deals, 
there's clearly an opportunity to underpin significant investment with a long-term land use strategy. Um, aware, for example, of the good work on this that is already underway in the Glasgow city region. The amendment is very broadly defined and appears to extend well beyond low carbon infrastructure. Infrastructure is complex uh, and we must bear in mind that it is delivered by private sector organisations as well as public bodies. Different approaches to needs assessments already exist reflecting the varying programmes and priorities of infrastructure providers. The key is not to duplicate those approaches, but to better coordinate and align them with development planning. Taking into account all of our ongoing work to better align planning with infrastructure investment in Scotland, I do not support Amendment 220, and in particular, its requirement to establish a new National Infrastructure Commission um, and would urge uh, Ms uh, Beamish not to press her amendment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Claudia Beamish to wind up. Right, uh, thank you very much, convener. Um, I, I'll be clear from the start that at this stage, in view of the uh, helpful discussions that have happened, that I won't be pressing my amendment today. Um, I, I, I'm not saying that I won't consider in discussion with others who I've worked with and possibly the minister, although there hasn't been that offer because I know that you're not very keen on it at all, um, but um, to, to um, consider bringing it back. I don't think in terms of um, uh, uh, Andy, um, Andy Whiteman's comment that just because something hasn't happened before that it can't happen, that just a precedent, uh, that, that if there hasn't been a precedent for it, then you know, there wasn't a precedent for the Climate Change Act in 2009. If we didn't have one, we'd be in more trouble than we even are. So uh, I don't think that's an argument for not doing something. Um, I, I do think um, that the Minister has given reassurance and um, in terms of uh, the better alignment and also in terms of the national um, planning framework, um, which obviously it's very important that low carbon is, is, is in that to underpin things. Um, in terms of Nina, it looks like Nina is going to now possibly die a death, I'm not sure, um, because um, it, it, the ministers explained how there are a lot of other um, opportunities for assessment and that the private sector is involved as well, although I do um, come back on that one to some degree um, uh, in that the private sector should still be ex expected to assess how, um, how they will be looking at uh, their, the infrastructure projects that they're tendering for in terms of low carbon. So I do think that's, that's important, um, even if there isn't a, an additional layer um, uh, which this would have bought. Um, so I'm somewhat reassured, and um, I won't go into any more detail, but there are a number of other points about city deals and different things that are encouraging. But I do think that the joined-up um, approach is absolutely vital for low carbon, which is why I bought this forward, and um, I'm glad that it's been highlighted and discussed. So thank you, convener. Thank you very much. Uh, Claudia Beamy wishes to withdraw her amendment. Does any member present have any objection to the amendment being withdrawn? Okay, thank you. We now move on to call amendment 42 in the name of Andy Whiteman, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Thank you very much, uh, convener. Section 2 of the bill repeals sections 4 to 14 of the Town Country Planning Scotland Act 1997. These provisions of the 97 Act relate to strategic development plans, and the effect of section 2 of the bill is to do away with strategic development planning in the planning system as it currently stands. My Amendment 42 deletes Section 2 and therefore has the effect of leaving the current system of strategic development plan, planning in place unaltered. Amendments 45, Amendments 46 to 50 uh, are consequential. Convener, we've been undertaking strategic development planning in Scotland for over 70 years, beginning with the Clyde Valley Regional Plan of 1946. Pioneers of Scottish regional planning, including Patrick Geddes and Ian McHarg, um, were pioneers in this uh, field. The committee's stage one report concluded that the current approach to strategic planning should not be abolished unless a more robust mechanism is provided. Now, at one of the events organised by the committee, I 
think it was an event in Stirling where we had quite a large number of uh, interested parties there um, having workshops and discussions around the future of the planning system. I spoke to a member of Clyde Plan, um, one of the strategic planning authorities in Scotland, uh, who emphasised the importance of a statutory strategic plan that was, enable, that was able, for example, to embed policies in relationship to hydrology in one local authority designed to prevent flooding in another. And the key ingredient there is that the statutory nature of the plan, because that locks in that kind of cross-authority work that is needed for effective spatial planning. If we don't have effective spatial planning, the temptation is for Authority 1 to abandon its policies in hydrology because they're not policies that really matter very much to it. They're policies that are designed, in this case, to stop flooding or prevent flooding or mitigate flooding in Glasgow, another planning um, authority. Now, we've had a number of um, proposals come to the table on how strategic planning could be carried on in future that build on the bill, take this forward, and I welcome, very much welcome that. Indeed, in Amendment 116, 116 last week from the Minister, um, it focused on voluntary working and securing regional outcomes through the national planning uh, framework. In, in my view, strategic planning is best undertaken by strategic planning partners, than by central government. I think national planning is different from strategic planning, and I think strategic planning needs to be owned by the authorities who are bound by its outcomes. Now, in the debate we had in stage one, um, it was acknowledged and agreed and recognised that there are mixed views um, on this uh, topic. Um, I've spoken further to interested parties uh, since then, and um, Broadly speaking, there's still that split, but a very large number of organisations are sceptical about losing strategic planning and would rather um, we keep it unless we can have robust replacements that are workable in place. And I am not convinced we're at that stage yet. I'm still open to persuasion that that could be reached by stage three. Amendment 85 incorporates the same statement on how a strategic development plan will take account of gender and of the impact on gender that I previously set out in the debate over Section 1 on the National Planning Framework. And again, I welcome Monica Lennon's amendment to more accurately reflect my intentions. Uh, Monica Lennon's Amendment 185 um, support. Uh, I support this. It provides the same new evidence report requirements as are provided in Section 3.4 uh, of the Bill. I also support Amendment 221. Convener, I move Amendment 42 in my name. Thank you very much. Before I ask Monica Lennon to speak to Amendment 85A, can I just point out that if Amendment 48 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 155, which was debated with Amendment 185 in Group National Planning Framework, because of a preemption. Monica, speak to Amendment 85A and other amendments in the group, please. Thank you. Um, Convener, um, I completely ag agree with, with Andy Whiteman's comments um, in relation to strategic development planning and I think the committee, our report reflected our, our concerns and our um, scepticism, um, but like Andy Whiteman, I think, you know, we, we remain um, open-minded and I look forward to hearing what the Minister has um, to say um, in relation to to 85A. Again, this kind of repeats the arguments that we made last week in relation to the national planning framework. This, of course, is about um, strategic development plans if we are going to retain them. And I think even some points that have been made earlier today in relation to provision of housing for older people, people with disabilities, I think this reinforces my argument to embed equality and human rights into the purpose for planning. So I hope that we can still um, keep that under review. I know there's been ongoing discussions with colleagues um, on that. Um, the reason why I've added um, equality at 85A to supplement Andy Whiteman's 85 is because we've had quite clear evidence um, from Engender and from others that, um, that gender uh, inequality is still not being actively um, considered in, in planning practice. And I think that we have big societal issues to deal with. They're not all for planning, but there is a clear interrelationship between gender and place, the built environment and, and power. And I think that this bill absolutely is the place to try and, and address that. Um, on strategic development plans, 
I know from the 2006 Act, when we moved from structure plans to strategic development plans, that in the, bear with me, in one of the, the circulars, um, yeah, Circular 2 of 2008, um, that, that required um, strategic development plan authorities um, to be established um, to have a, a common approach to matters that extend beyond individual authority boundaries, such as housing markets, travel to work, hydrology is, is a good example. And I also note that in terms of governance, the circular said that strategic development plan authority should be served by a small dedicated dedicated team of officers, so that sounds very sensible. But over the summer, doing further research, speaking to Clyde Plan and others, I've learned that there are only eight full-time charter planners working across the four strategic development plan authorities. And, you know, I'd be interested to hear what the Minister thinks of this, but it sounds like, you know, people have got the message from government that you know, you want to run down these SDPAs, so already people are withdrawing resource because it doesn't seem adequate to me that for 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 uh, for Glasgow, for for Aberdeen um, region, for Tayside, for for Cess Plan area, that we only have eight full time chartered planners working across those four authorities. So I think the point I'm trying to get to, Minister, is if that if we leave this to a voluntary code, and we know how. Um, pressured resources are in, in planning authorities, that we might not really have a strategic planning at that cross-boundary level as, as we know it. I'm happy to take the intervention. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, I uh, well, I, I was going to actually try and catch the computer's eye, but yeah. um, I'm grateful on a specific yeah, issue no of um, uh, two issues briefly. One uh, on your amendment, uh, Monica, about um, picking up Nandi's amendment gender and then adding the word equality. I just I always am a concern, I speak as a lawyer by trade, that the minute you start singling out certain groups, you then raise the question, which I tried to allude to the previous set of amendments, what, whether other people... So surely everybody as a basic human right has the expectation of being treated equally under planning legislation. And in any event, in terms of drafting, the minute you start to... Uh, you know, subdivide a general term, whatever it may be, you, you have the you risk actually excluding, which is not your intention, a whole series of other scenarios and, and situations. So that would be my concern on that amendment. And in terms of the, the strategic development plan, I mean, I had thought, and I'm a new member to this committee, so uh, please excuse me, but I had thought that one of the key of goals of this bill was to simplify the planning system. It seems to me what we're in danger of doing is actually going off in all different directions and, and going from the status quo, which people apparently want to amend, to something that perhaps you know, we're unleashing on the world that we don't actually intend, which is a bill that is incredibly complicated. So I just make those two brief points. Thank you for taking the interview. No, I appreciate the points that Annabel Ewing has made. I don't have the official report from last week in front of me, but I think one of the points that the minister perhaps was making is that, that within... Um, everyday planning processes, there is consideration given to, to gender impact. And for example, there's been an equality impact assessment of the bill. The problem is, is that in gender, who are a highly respected women's organisation, who've just had their 25th anniversary and the first minister spoke in the garden lobby at their event. So they, they are taken very seriously, but they have said that the equality impact assessment for this bill is pretty useless when it comes to gender. Now, I know the minister committed to meet within gender, and I'm not sure if the meeting has taken place. So I think it is important that, that we're reassured as a committee that, that planners and others who have a role in the planning system have the tools to properly uh, look at gender and other protected characteristics. Um, by putting gender and equality and human rights into the face of the bill and to the purpose for planning and to have that embedded at national planning framework level, at SDP level, if we're keeping them local plan level, and on that daily development management um, level, is, is to make sure that that's everyone's business. It shouldn't be complicated. It's not about trying to prioritise one person's needs over another. But when we think about gender, we're talking about women making up more than half the population here in Scotland. But if we look at um, a whole plethora of academic research, the built environment is still 
being designed largely by men for the benefit of men. Now, it's not been done deliberately. I know Graeme Simpson is shuddering at, you know, as I say this. Um, and, and, it, and it is regrettable that, you know, I only man, it's only Andy and I at the moment who are supporting me. I hope that, that Conservative members and SNP members will, will, when the time we get to stage three, maybe come alive to this. So... We take the brief intervention. Yeah. Uh, on the issue of, of simplification, I was more referring to your second point about the role of strategic development plans, mm -hmm. uh, just to clarify. But, I, you know, I'm in favour of everybody's human rights. And, of course, human rights uh, underpin this planning bill. Right? That's, you know, a given. So I just le remain a wee bit perplexed as to how we're singling out the human rights of some and not others. And I think I see dangers in that as a matter uh -huh. of, of just basic drafting. Yeah. So, well, I think, it, again, it goes back to the purpose of why we plan. So that's why some members have brought forward amendments to put a purpose of planning into the bill. And I'm glad that the minister um, has, has come some way towards that. We all had different views on what that purpose of planning should be. But, you know, I've got a suite of amendments which uh, are seeking to improve public health through planning, not make it worse, to tackle inequality in our society uh, through planning decisions. You know, I, I think... You know, I know that some members only joined the committee last week, but we have heard extensive evidence that planning decisions do exacerbate inequality. We see that in the clustering of certain types of development uh, in communities, whether that's through uh, betting shops. You know, these ideas are, are well established and, and there's you know, there's parliamentarians across this, this, this parliament who raise these issues routinely, but we have a big opportunity in this legislation to to embed these these principles and to see what planning is for and then we can empower planners and other decision makers um, to make sure it's their responsibility it's not about saying that that women are more important than men um, that people with disabilities are more important than than older people without disabilities but it's, a ma it's about making sure that that we are aware of all these things and that when we're making planning decisions and setting planning policy that we're not um, we're not blind to these, these consequences. Um, but I'll, I'll leave that point there, convener. Um, I think just to go back to strategic d development plans, um, I, I think that, for example, um, Clyde Plan, which covers the, the area where, where I live, has done some really Im important work. Um, I think you know this, this cross-boundary working is really important, um, and I don't think we can just leave that to, to, to chance, uh, particularly because I think planning authorities uh, are under so much pressure with resources, and already during the, the life of this bill, we've seen staffing levels reduced to only eight planners across four strategic development plan authorities. So um, these are the kind of concerns that I, I think the Minister you know, really has to address. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Minister. Thank you, Convener. Um, before uh, I move into the guts of all of this, I'd like to um, briefly reflect on last week's session to set the context for my comments today. Um, I think that we all want to deliver a, a stronger planning system for Scotland uh, that works for everyone. The amendments that the committee makes to this bill could have a significant impact in the way that the planning system works or doesn't work um, in the future. Um, based on the amendments that were agreed last week, um, I believe that there is a real danger um, that the original um, aims of planning reform will not be achieved. In fact, if we continue to load in more and more detailed requirements, uh, we can't, could end up with a system that wor works for no one uh, rather than for everyone. Our proposals included removing the bureaucracy of strategic development plans and the duplication of supplementary guidance in order to produce savings in time and costs that could then be used more productively. If the committee chooses to retain these elements, um, there will be no savings uh, to resource new ways of working, never mind the uh, additional duties that members want to add. I would also ask the committee to always be aware uh, that changes they make to one part of the system will have wider consequences and bear in mind the responsibility we all have to make a system that is workable. Whilst many of the additional new duties the committee agreed last week 
um, will fall to the Scottish Government uh, and indeed this Parliament, I would ask members to bear in mind the particular risks around overloading local authorities with duties um, that they are unable to resource. If we continue to add in numerous minor amendments to this bill, together they will make the system much more complex and much harder to run, adding significant time and costs. And I would encourage all members not to move their amendments unless they are confident that they will be deliverable. If the Scottish Government supports amendments in principle, I'm happy to work with any and all members uh, to ensure that they will work in practice without generating significant unintended consequences. Um, when I laid this bill last December, I was seeking to streamline the planning system uh, and my commitment to removing procedures that don't add value has been strongly supported not only by professional stakeholders, uh, but also by members of the public. In considering this bill, we should no not lose sight of the fact that many people consider the existing system to be complicated, frustrating, time-consuming and impenetrable in many, many cases. And I listened to what the committee said about strategic planning in their stage one report uh, and brought forward a new duty for strategic planning in Amendment 116. Uh, this would have reflected the committee's concerns about the loss of strategic planning. However, Amendment 116 has now fallen, uh, and I may bring out the provisions on strategic planning reports and resubmit these at Stage 3 to allow the Parliament to consider the options together. I know that the committee has heard calls for strategic development plans to be retained, um, with some vocal supporters, uh, particularly some planning professionals who have been personally involved uh, in planning at this scale. However, I am not convinced that there has been a balance between evidence and opinion on this topic. And I would ask the committee to consider whether strategic development plans in their current form are having a significant impact. Um, from what has been said, it seems that most of the successes with strategic or regional planning were achieved decades ago, long before the current arrangements emerged. Strategic or regional planning used to have real influence, and I'm concerned that this is no longer the case. I've made it very clear that we want to improve and strengthen strategic planning, not to undermine it. Unfortunately, our efforts to improve flexibility and rationalise the system have been misinterpreted or misconstrued as a complete abolition of strategic planning. This has never been my intention. Mr Whiteman's Amendment 42 seeks to retain strategic development plans in their current form. If the committee supports this, it means that the development plan would in the future have three tiers, including the MPF, SDPs and LDPs. Rather than streamlining, this would add complexity to the process. It would also mean that we miss significant opportunities for more collaborative working. Uh, there would be no impetus for strategic planners to get involved in the new opportunities that are emerging at a regional scale. And I doubt that the pace of change and investment arising from city deals can be informed by strategic planning if planners continue to operate within a rigid development plan cycle. We need to free up planners so they can better contribute to inclusive growth by being actively involved in regional partnerships. The amendment would retain the requirement for a new plan to be submitted within four years of the current plan being approved when the national planning framework and local development plans are moving to a 10-year cycle. I do not want strategic planning to be bogged down in procedures and for our strategic planners to adopt a plan and then immediately move on to preparing the next one rather than actively promoting its delivery, and they should have a longer-term focus. I also want strategic planning to be flexible in terms of geography and the arrangements local authorities make for government, governance rather than being dictated and fixed in regulations. It should also 
uh, allow all local authorities to decide what works best for them, rather than being driven by ministers. Monica Lennon supports retaining strategic development plans, but has some changes to suggest. Her proposal to replace main issues reports with an evidence report reflects the new procedures for local development plans. But there would be no benefit and the much bigger opportunities arising from a new approach, an approach which is not entirely focused on preparing a plan in isolation, would be lost. I have particular concerns that Amendment 189 also removes the examination of strategic development plans. Presumably, Ms Lennon thinks strategic development plans would still be part of the statutory development plan, but without any independent scrutiny. I would ask Mr Simpson and others to think about how the stakeholders that they have been working with, um, like Homes for Scotland, uh, would actually feel about that. Experience has also shown uh, that we can have little confidence that strategic development plans would be adequate if they were not independently examined. Whilst I can't comment on specific plans, including those which are currently before me, some strategic development plans have had problems tackling significant issues, leaving them to be addressed by the examination. Uh, I would not like to speculate on whether this is, a, this is because authorities are unable to properly tackle the challenging issues or down to a reliance on the examination or ministers to make difficult decisions on their behalf. This includes issue, issues such as housing requirements, uh, retail and town centre allocations, and major cross-boundary infrastructure requirements. And I'm sure the committee can see that these are not matters of detail, but significant issues that strategic development plans are failing to address. In short, this amendment has significant disadvantages. It does not tackle the existing issues with strategic planning in the way that my proposals would. In fact, it will compound the problems we have seen for some years now, and in so doing, jeopardise the credibility of the planning system as a whole, and I would urge the committee not to support it. Similarly, I do not support Amendment 221. This amendment seeks to insert strategic and cross-boundary planning matters into local development plans. As I said in my response to the Committee's Stage 1 report, this could result in a loss of strategic focus as well as duplication and confusion between plans. I now come to Amendment 85 in the name of Andy Whiteman and 85A in the name of Monica Lennon. If I'll, as I've already set out my response to related amendments around gender inequalities. Uh, and whilst I fully recognise and support these issues, I would ask the committee uh, to bear in mind the existing requirements under the Equality Act before adding any further duties, and I would ask that you do not support these amendments. As I've already said, um, I, 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 very briefly, very briefly. Thank you. It's the engender questions. I've raised it a couple of times uh, last week and this week. Um, Minister, have you had a meeting with engender and can you explain to the committee why you think engender say that the quality impact assessment for the bill in relation to gender is pretty useless? I've had correspondence with engender and with other organisations. Um, I outlined last week um, in uh, great detail, and I'm not going to do it again, convener, all of the responsibilities that we have as ministers and as parliamentarians, which are, are outlined in various pieces of legislation, inclu including the Equality Act. Um, and I think that adding this um, to um, the face of the bill um, takes away um, from what is, are already our duties uh, and should cover every aspect of legislation that this parliament sets. Um, as I've already said, convener, um, I proposed a, a new approach to, st to strategic planning in Amendment 116, uh, but the committee has not supported it. The original bill provisions for the national planning framework still include scope for authorities to work together to inform the national planning framework and could allow for a more flexible approach to strategic planning. However, if strategic development plans are retained, it's unlikely that authorities will be able to work as closely 
with the government in preparing the national planning framework. It also leaves the rest of the country out with the four SDP areas operating in a different context. And we estimated um, that the removing uh, of the formal process around strategic development plans would free up around £2.5 million for more effective ways of working. That will no longer be available if these amendments are agreed. I'll, I'll take Mr Simpson very briefly. Thank you. Um, I've listened uh, very carefully to all the contributions. Um, now, the Stage 1 report uh, merely reflected uh, that we had heard uh, no evidence um, that getting rid of, of strategic development plans was a good thing. And what we called for in that report was if we, if, if we were to agree to get rid of them, there should be something more robust in its place, because we all agree that, that need, there is a need for regional working. Uh, that can be the, the driver of growth in Scotland, and that's what we need. Uh, so we do need this, but what we've not heard uh, is something better. So what I'd simply do uh, to, to the Minister is encourage him uh, to reflect on that, think about it for stage three, if he's got better ideas, to talk to people about them, um, and that may well be the stage to uh, look at this again. Convener, I put uh, forward better ideas in Amendment 116. Unfortunately, that was rejected by the committee last week. But I do fully intend at stage three um, to bring back similar proposals. I'm always willing to talk to members um, around about aspects uh, of this, um, and Mr Simpson knows that my office door is open. Um, but I would um, reiterate uh, the points that I have made around about these amendments today. Um, and I would reiterate the point um, uh, that, you know, as it stands at the moment, um, we have uh, four areas which are uh, planning strategically. I think other areas uh, need to look at that. Uh, I, looking at Mr Gibson, um, you know, if the Ayrshire deal is the next uh, growth deal that we have, it would be good if there was flexibility uh, within the Ayrshires to plan strategically at a regional level. And 116, if it had been accepted, the proposals in there would have given um, the, uh, that Mr. opportunity. Could you, could you begin to draw your comments? I, 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 will, I will, Convener. Um, again, I would say that the committee should not underestimate the importance uh, of the decisions that they will make on this group of amendments. If members decide to retain strategic development plans or worse still, an even more unwork unworkable version of them, they are increasing, not reducing complexity and duplication within the system and allowing a small but vocal group of planners in Scotland to cling to an outdated and ineffective pursuit which, which costs a lot and provides very little benefit in return. I expect Mr Whiteman and Ms Lennon will press their amendments, but I would urge the committee to reject them today. OK, thank you, Minister. Andy Whiteman, to wind up, please. Uh, um, thank you, Convener. Uh, this is a government bill. The onus is on the government to make a case for change, and our job in Parliament is to scrutinise that case and assess whether it's well made or not. The views of the committee at stage one were that that case has not been uh, made. Now, as I think I indicated last week, it may not have, but I will this week, um, there are the strategic development parts of Amendment 116 contained some merit. Um, of course, the problem we had with 116 was not only did it seek to make changes to Section 1, it was trying to make changes to Section 2 at the same time as well, and therefore we didn't really have much uh, choice uh, in the matter. Um, time remains. Um, we will have a three or four weeks yet to get through stage two. Uh, time remains to have further discussions about how some of the problems that the minister claims exist in the current system can be uh, rectified. And in, the, um, uh, in, in preparation for that, my amendment 42 retains the status quo, which I think is the appropriate uh, thing to do where a case has not been uh, well made. Um, I am very open to have discussions about, for example, um, cycles and strategic development planning. I am very happy to have discussions about 
um, the kind of ideas the Minister has around the future of regional planning. I think there can be changes that can be made. I think there are deficiencies in the current uh, system, but I repeat, the case for change, particularly the case that's been made and the details have been put forward, that are essentially voluntarist and also place a significant um, responsibility for regional planning on ministers, who are responsible, in my view, for national planning, uh, principally, um, is not, in my view, robust regional planning. Uh, on the question of... Uh, 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 Mr um, Whiteman there, um, because as I pointed out um, in my contribution, one of the difficulties that we have with um, strategic development planning as it exists at this moment in time is that it is not robust, um, and during the course of the examination, it often falls um, to ministers and others uh, to point out the difficult decisions um, that the current setup uh, SDPs will not take. Um, and, you know, I'm in a difficult position, convener, in terms of giving examples and all of this, uh, because some of these matters um, are still alive. But I would ask um, all members of the committee to look at some of the difficulties that there have been in recent times when it comes to things like agreement on housing numbers or even, or even constructing infrastructure. I thank the Minister for his intervention. I think there's a critical difference, though, between whether a process is robust and whether the plans produced as a consequence of that process are robust. And if I hear the Minister correctly, he's talking about deficiencies in the plans presented at examination. Now, I'd want further convincing that those deficiencies are a consequence of a flawed process. And I'm perfectly happy to listen to that evidence and be persuaded on that evidence, because this bill is about process. Um, on the question of, of, of gender, the proposal in Amendment 85 uh, is for a statement. That's all it requires. It requires a statement. A statement to be made, in this instance, in a strategic development plan. And I hear what the Minister says about the broader duties placed on public authorities around equalities, etc., and I don't dispute them, they exist. But the point about a statement is as a means to assess whether those duties that the Minister rightly argues exist are being upheld. And we have a lot of... Intervention on that point. Happy. I'm most grateful to Andy Whiteman for taking the intervention. I just make the, 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 the same point, which is, well, what about, the, you know, a statement on housing needs of vets? What about a statement in this context on the housing needs of... Uh, families with a disabled child what about you know a statement on you know everybody has an expectation of being treated fairly under the planning system uh, and that includes obviously uh, uh, issues regarding gender and other protected characteristics but my point is you know we are creating a system for everybody and therefore the minute you start limiting who this particular provisions are to apply to there is the danger that you are not then treating everybody fairly is there not? I hear the point, thanks. Thank you very much to Annabel Ewing uh, for intervention on, on housing for vets and disabled children, etc. Uh, that's not in the same domain as the question we're considering here on gender. There is a lot of academic evidence that the planning system is highly gendered. That academic existence is fairly broad. We have, I could point the member, for example, to the planning, uh, the plans in, in Vienna, which are regarded as very, very progressive and have identified a ra huge range of issues on which planning outcomes have been highly gendered and they have sought to rectify them. So this is a major problem. It, it affects half the population. Uh, and whilst I totally take on board that the planning system should deal with everyone with appropriate needs, I don't think they're on the same scale as the evidence that's been presented in relationship uh, to uh, gender. And the, the requirement to make this statement, I'll just conclude here, um, in a... In a if, you, if, the, if the member's willing to take an intervention, make it very brief, Minister. Happy. Uh, I will be very brief, because the statement is very similar to the EQIA, um, required by the Equality Act, uh, which is enforceable uh, by the EHRC. Um, and that stands alone, so I don't see what the difficulty in all of this is and why it requires a separate statement in this legislation when the legislation that already exists is all-encompassing. 
I take that point. I return, however, to my point that there is a substantial body of evidence that shows the planning system in many countries continues to be highly gendered. And a statement is the means to assess whether uh, that uh, whether those duties that the minister refers to are indeed being up, 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 upheld. Um, so just to conclude, um, the point of putting this on the face of the bill is to uh, require planning authorities to have some consideration on, on this point. To make a statement, that statement need not be um, lengthy. It uh, can be as detailed or as or as or as lengthy as the planning authority wishes. But it forces a consideration of that question. If we don't embed that, the danger is that the flaws that exist in the system that are systemic uh, will remain. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Andy Whiteman. Uh, uh, I ask you to press or withdraw. Press Amendment Forty Two. Thank you. The question is: that Amendment Forty Two be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yeah. Uh, those who are in favour? Those who are opposed? That's 4 3. Okay, the, the amendment was agreed to 4 3. Sorry? Yeah. I call Amendment 85 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 42. Andy Whiteman to move or not? Move. I call Amendment 85A in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 42. Monica Lennon to move yes. or not? Thank you. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 85A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Those opposed? OK, thank you. Thank you. The amendment falls. Uh, Andy Whiteman to press or withdraw Amendment 85. Uh, press. Moved. The question is that Amendment 85 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay. Those in favour? Those opposed? 85 falls. Thank you. I call Amendment 189 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 42. Monica Lennon to move or not? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 189 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Those in favour of 189? Those opposed? 4-3 for 189. The amendment is passed. Call amendment 221 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with amendment 42. Monica. Move. Uh, those in favour? Sorry, Sorry, the question is amendment 221 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Right, those in favour? Those against? 4-3 in favour. Amendment 2-2-1 is agreed to. Uh, I think at this point it might be a suitable time to take a short break. Uh, let's have a five minute comfort break and then come back and get started again.
Okay. Uh, I'll now call Amendment 86 in the name of Andy Whiteman, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Andy. Thank you very much, um, Convener. Right, we're now on to group on local development plans. Um, I move Amendment 86 in my name. Amendment 86 incorporates the same statement on how a local development plan will take account of gender, and we've discussed this, I think, at, 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 at length, and I won't say anything uh, more uh, on that. Amendment 173 provides a local development plan to include a statement on plans and policies in relation to listed buildings. This provides an opportunity to highlight to owners of such buildings the kind of uses the planning authority considers appropriate. I've had quite extensive discussion with interested parties on this, and whilst there is some interest in this and they feel there's some merit in some of this, um, this amendment may be more appropriately drafted to refer only to buildings on a register of buildings in disappear at risk. I'd be interested in the views of the committee, uh, and I'll be considering not pressing this amendment uh, and discussing it further uh, 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 for stage um, three. Amendment 176 uh, requires planning authorities to take into account the open spaces strategy proposed under Amendment 171, already uh, debated and uh, agreed. Um, I am broadly supportive of uh, most other amendments uh, in this group, uh, and I just want uh, Convener um, to speak to Amendment 163 in the name of John Finney, who's unable to be here uh, today. John uh, last week moved and the committee passed Amendment 160, and that sought to have the national planning framework have regard to the desirability of preserving disused railway infrastructure for the purpose of ensuring its availability for possible future public transport uh, requirements. Amendment 163 makes exactly the same ask, but with regard to the local development uh, plan, and clearly uh, Amendment 160 was indeed um, supported, uh, and therefore I think it would be logical to support Amendment 163. Um, that's all I have to say, Convener. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was commendably brief. Um, if everybody else wants to follow that example, I'd be more than happy. Uh, Monica Lennon to move Amendment 86 a and speak to all other amendments in the group. Oh, all uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Well, like Andy, I, I wouldn't uh, labour the points on, on gender and equality. I think we've, we've made those, those arguments and we'll keep making them at later uh, meetings. On... Uh, 107 convener um, this is about asking planning authorities to assess the health implications of decisions um, I appreciate the, the minister's point last week that that land use planning can't reach into every aspect of, of health but I don't believe that that justifies excluding health considerations from the local development plan um, so I hope that the committee will agree and take the opportunity to improve health outcomes uh, in this, this manner OK. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Monica. Uh, Kenneth Gibson to speak to Amendment 172 and other amendments in the group. Yes, uh, thank you, convener. On amendments 172, 174, uh, 175 and 54A, in my name, are the last uh, four of a set of amendments to facilitate the provision of sufficient homes which meet the specific needs of older people and disabled people. In this respect, it's important that local development plans should be informed by the national targets and the national planning framework, as we have already agreed last week. Amendment 172 specifies the need for the local development plan to include targets for the provision of housing for older people and disabled people for the part of the district to which it relates. And this should include the adaptation of existing housing to meet the housing needs of older people and disabled people and the building of new housing to meet the needs of older people and disabled people. Amendment 174 uh, seeks to ensure that local development plans include a detailed statement of the priority being given uh, by the planning authority to address the housing needs of older people and disabled people and the policies and proposals of planning authority is progressing and will progress. Amendment 175 would require planning authorities to include details in local development plans of any land designated for the development of older people's housing, making an important contribution to addressing the housing needs of older people and disabled people by ensuring planning authorities focus on their housing needs when preparing LDPs. And Amendment 54A is simply an amendment to Alexander uh, Stewart's um, 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 Amendment 54, uh, merely to add uh, and disabled people to his own comments. Thank you. Uh, Graeme Swampson to speak to Amendment 34. Thanks, Convener. I'll also uh, try, yeah, um, I'll try not to take up too much time. Um, uh, I've got a few amendments here, 34, 35, 73, 36, 37, 7 and 75. Um, it's not as bad as it sounds. Um, the, 
the theme behind uh, many of the amendments uh, is around the protection of the green belt and localising of decision making. Um, so if we look at amendment 34 first, uh, the intention there is for local planning authorities to prepare and maintain a register of previously developed brownfield land. Uh, the amendment would effectively mean that councils would direct development to brownfield land ahead of uh, Greenbelt. And the key word in the amendment is uh, uh, presumption. So uh, there is some flexibility there, which I think is important. Um, I think that's got to be right because every bit of evidence uh, that this committee has certainly heard shows the need to keep green spaces for people's physical and mental health. And that's the intention behind this. The effect of Amendment 34 uh, would also be to direct development into uh, existing towns and cities, maybe even town centres, uh, and that's sorely needed. Um, but like another amendment uh, that I have here, I uh, realise that this is probably not the finished article, and uh, I may well need to uh, make some changes at stage three, and I'm happy to have discussions about that. Uh, now, convener, um, I've always believed that variety is the spice of life, and that applies to homes as well as uh, other things. Uh, we should be making things easier uh, for people to build their own homes. And one way of doing this is to make uh, plots easily identified through a register of self-build plots. Amendment 35, which is welcomed by Scottish land and estates, would facilitate this. The register would be publicly visible. Uh, and people who wish to build their own homes uh, could express an interest uh, in, the, in, in the plots. Uh, now, there's a, a, a similar thing uh, down <coughs> south, um, but the, the difference there is that there are registers of those who are interested uh, in building uh, self-build, and that's kept by councils. Uh, that sort of scheme was put in place by the <coughs> Greater London Authority, where public land was released for development, uh, and it did help to increase the housing supply across the area. The scheme run by the GLA was uh, imaginatively called Build Your Own London Home Register. It could easily be reproduced as a Build Your Own Scottish Home Register, why we invent the wheel. The register could empower people to shape their own <laughs> living spaces the way they want and contribute to vibrant and varied communities. Uh, and facilitating this custom build approach would empower individuals and groups uh, and strengthen neighbourhood links and create local construction jobs, which is a good thing. Would certainly. Um, thank you to Graeme Simpson. I think it's certainly an interesting concept. It's certainly not onerous on planning authorities for individuals to declare themselves as being interested in, in self-build. But if a planning authority is to provide a list of sites, I'm presuming map-based, uh, for every piece of land that could be suitable for self-build, that's a pretty serious task and to keep that up to date would be very resource intensive. I'm just wondering if, if Graham Simpson can say more about what he thinks this would look like, look like in practice because it sounds like a very a very big job and would that include, you know, for example, someone who has a, a very large garden and their cartilage might lend itself to subdivision but that homeowner might have no interest in selling off a bit of their land. So I just wonder how, how that works and how it could work in practice. I'm just checking if Mr Stewart is all right. He's doing a lot of coughing. Uh, wasn't that a bad a question? It was a very fair question. I just want to make sure Mr Stewart's OK before I answer it. Thank you. Good. Um, I think it's... Uh, it, it's, it's a good point, and actually um, this, this would be another amendment that I think, if passed, um, could be improved on for stage three, because um, the way I would see this working is that it, it could apply just to council-owned land, because I take uh, Monica Lennon's point that to widen it out uh, to non-council non land would be an, an enormous task, but uh, I'd like to think that people would see the the merit in, in the proposal, and I'm certainly prepared to look at it again for stage three. Um, when it comes to the formulation uh, of local development plans, I felt the planning bill had left out a few vital considerations, uh, and so amendments 36, 37, uh, and 75 would ensure housing need, educational service, and built heritage are taken into consideration when local development plans are being put together. 
Um, I believe that the local development plan should be consistent with the NPF. Uh, the NPF will now go through a lot of scrutiny, thanks to the amendment in my name passed last week, uh, and it will provide the direction of development on the national scale, but it seems to me only sensible uh, that plans need to be joined up um, and local development plans should be consistent uh, with the national, uh, uh, national planning framework. Uh, so Amendment 7 is merely to make that happen. And there we are. It wasn't too painful, was it? Well, thank you, anyway. Uh, thank you, Graham. The, I now welcome Alison Johnson to speak to an amendment. And I should have said earlier on, welcome to all the other MSPs who are here that uh, aren't members of the committee with their amendments, but there were so many, I thought it would take half the meeting up. So, uh, Alison, can I ask you to speak to Amendment 161 and other amendments in the group? Um, thank you, convener. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, amendments 161 and 162 seek to introduce a requirement for planning authorities to consider the provision of public conveniences and water refill stations as part of their local development plans. And I'll deal first with Amendment 161 on the provision of public conveniences. A lack of accessible and functioning public toilets reduces the quality of our neighbourhoods, of our parks, of all our public places, and it reduces the quality of our lives. And we're seeing the widespread closure of public conveniences across the country, with the number of council-owned bathrooms falling from 759 in 2000 to 421 this year. And the Press and Journal found that, on average, Scottish local authorities have closed 45% of their public toilets. Now, the NHS estimates that three to six million people in the UK suffer from some degree of urinary incontinence, and the shortage of public toilets can hamper their quality of life. I mean, this is an age. This is an issue that affects all age groups: the elderly, you know, young children. It affects us all: disabled people, pregnant women. Active travellers needing clean, uh, just access, free and easy access to clean toilets. It really does affect us all. Age UK highlight that this is an issue that's preventing many old people from going out and about on a daily basis. They're losing their confidence, they're reluctant to visit new places, and this, of course, increases isolation. As we live in an ageing society, this isn't going to get to go away. It's going to become more of an issue. And that's perhaps why, why the World Health Organisation chose to highlight the availability of clean, conveniently located, well-signed, disabled accessible toilets as a major indicator in its age-friendly cities guides. Now, I'd just like to make clear that the intention here isn't to introduce a statutory duty to provide public conveniences, but to require a planning authority to give full consideration as to whether the provision of toilets can improve our public places as part of its overall plans for a local area. So this could be part of a community access scheme, such as that run by the City of Edinburgh Council, where businesses are paid £500 a year to allow free access to their toilets. New developments could be encouraged to plan for their toilets to be accessible to the public in a similar manner. And I'll now turn to Amendment 162. This seeks, in a similar fashion, to require planning authorities to consider the provision of water refill locations in its local development plan. When the blight of plastic pollution has come to the fore over the past year, with shocking footage emerging of the damage throwaway plastics have on environments around the world. And the Scottish Government has already shown initiative by pledging to bring forward a ban on plastic stemmed cotton buds, for example. But this amendment seeks to reduce our need for single use plastic bottles by encouraging local authorities to provide the infrastructure needed to give access to free water refill locations. And this is an urgent environmental problem. Fewer than half of the bottles bought in 2016 were collected for recycling, and only 7% of those collected were actually turned into new bottles. Um, certainly, Mr Simpson. Thanks. Um, I think these are uh, sort of very, very interesting uh, areas. Um, but I just want to be clear, I think, I think you possibly uh, touched on it earlier, that this would not compel councils to provide uh, water fountains uh, or, or toilets, uh, because clearly the reason why we have fewer public toilets is councils have less money. What, what it, it won't compel them to provide them, Mr Simpson, but it will compel them to include a statement of their intentions in this regard. 
Um, I'm sure colleagues uh, around the table here are finding that this is an increasing topic of, of mailbag correspondence. I mean, I have... Uh, the letter deal with the first one first, Paul. Yeah, um, yes. Uh, this, uh, I've been contacted, I, I represent Lothian, but I've been contacted by uh, people here in Lothian and, and as far afield as the Highlands on this matter, I suppose as my role in, as health and spokes, you know, spokesperson. And uh, the indignity and lack of privacy that some people have had to endure while travelling about this country, basically, you know, trying to to carry out a perfectly normal bodily function is, is completely unacceptable. So I think the least we can ask is that a planning authority sets out what its intentions are, because local authorities are closing facilities and it is having an impact on our health. But it, it doesn't compel them to provide you know, a single toilet block. As the City of Edinburgh Council have demonstrated, there are, there are various ways of dealing with this. I'd just like to understand what it is that local authorities intend. Pauline, would you like to come in? Thank you very much, Convener. I just wanted to add my voice to the issues that Alison Johnson's raising. It would be remiss of me since the cross-party group on inflammatory bowel diseases meeting tonight. And like many other groups, it's a big campaign for those who suffer. And we know in Scotland there's been a rise of young people with inflammatory bowel disease. They are part of a scheme. If you get a key for the radar scheme, it's quite important. But with the reducing number of facilities, it's causing a real problem. And to think... Perhaps we're in the dark ages in Scotland that you, know, you just can't just use a public toilet when you need to. But certainly there are needs of other people in society with greater needs of others. And I just wanted to add to the record that people with IBD, with their growing incidence in Scotland, need to be able to have the confidence when they're out and about that they can access a public toilet. Thank you very much. No, I, I, I thank colleagues for those interventions. I mean, I think it's fair to say we, pro we probably all grew up in an era where public water fountains were the norm. Um, and as they've disappeared, uh, you know, there's been an increased reliance on, on you know, single-use plastic bottles. I mean, I think the Victorians introduced both public conveniences and fountains into our towns and cities, but we have lost many of them um, because it's quicker and convenient sometimes to to go and buy a bottle and I, I am heartened I am seeing local businesses now saying you can refill your water bottle here but I think it'd be helpful to understand what the options are um, across the country and this obviously would it would cut back plastic waste that costs uh, it costs us all a fortune you know it it's one of the things we're paying for through our council tax so there's there's a saving to be made there too as well as an environmental benefit um, Scotland could follow the lead taken by the Netherlands it has a, a programme called Join the Pipe, and it's installed more than 2,000 water taps throughout the country in public spaces, parks, sports fields, schools, and it provides convenient refill. It, it, it's also selling its own refillable bottles. Um, you know, the city of Amsterdam sells its own refillable bottles to encourage tourists not to go down the, the single-use plastic uh, route And closer to home, campaigners in Bristol have encouraged 200 businesses to sign up to a scheme to allow people to refill bottles for free. So I, I think it's about making sure that there's public awareness too as to what's available. I mean, it's undoubtedly the case that some people still feel, even when you can access a public convenience in a, a local cafe or something, it has to be made, people have to understand that that's acceptable because we have people who are very uncomfortable still asking for keys um, to use a public toil a toilet. They may be uncomfortable asking for codes, so there'll have to be some education around this too. Um, but, you know, the Mayor of London is currently overseeing the rollout of public fountains um, across Scotland, and um, I'm sure we'd all agree that Scottish water is, um, <laughs> is I'm, not, I'm not going to say anything bad about uh, water in London, but we have great water here in Scotland and we really should not be making, we should really be making the most of it. Yeah, uh, sure. Thank you, Alison. I just want to speak um, to, to welcome both of these amendments and I think your, your commentary has been really useful. I think, you know, hopefully we all agree that access to toilets and to drinking water is a basic human right. And certainly some of us, through um, the opportunity the bill presents, are trying to embed that uh, into every part of, of the planning system. Um, I recently spoke to Morvan Brooks, who's the Chief Executive of Disability Equality Scotland. Um, 
And again, the points that you've already made, but she talked about disabled people being humiliated, people being stuck at home. So we've got other parts of government looking to to work on strategies to tackle loneliness and, and social isolation. And I think what we're all trying to do here is, is to make sure that, that all of these strands of policy are joined up. So I think Alison's amendments are are proportionate because it's asking planning authorities to be mindful and to provide a statement is to acknowledge some of the issues and some of the challenges and um, certainly implementation and delivery uh, is, is a matter for others it might be for for the council um, but it might be for others because in, in a positive note I think the more we raise awareness if I can give the example of network rail so here in, in Edinburgh um, with another campaign, campaign hat on around period poverty, they, they've agreed that they'll remove the, the toilet charges and they'll provide water fountains next year. Um, but again, if we can put that into the mind of every planning authority, um, it will spark conversations like that with developers and other partners in the public sector. So I think these kind of amendments really do add value to the planning bill. Okay, thank you. Can I just remind people that when the, you're intervening to make your intervention short, We've got a lot to get through and we've got very little time to get through it. Uh, Alison? Yeah, I'm uh, just closing, um, convener. I think, you think Amendment 162 could encourage planning authorities to go further along the, the path that um, I've been describing and allow local authorities to innovate their own schemes to provide free drinking water and reduce levels of plastic waste. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Polly McNeil to speak to Amendment 222 and other amendments in the group. Um, thank you very much, Convener. Um, I speak to Amendment 222 and 223 in my name. Um, I've been working with Inclusion Scotland and Age Scotland on these two amendments, which essentially deal with accessible housing and dementia-friendly homes. It has already been mentioned by Kenny Gibson and uh, Alexander uh, Stewart previously, um, so perhaps there's some duplication, but I'll speak to what my amendments seek to do. I agree that the planning system alone cannot provide a complete solution, but we need to encourage bolder action on housing that is needed for disabled people and housing which is dementia friendly. 14% of households in Scotland include someone who uses a wheelchair or mobility aid, but yet only 0.7% of Scottish local authority uh, housing and 1.5% of housing association property is accessible for wheelchairs. Research by Horizon and the Chartered Institute of Housing in 2012 estimated that there were over 17,000 wheelchair users in Scotland with unmet housing needs, um, and this is widely ex accepted to be an underestimate. So the government have a commitment to build 50,000 new homes, which is welcome, but it is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to address the shortfall in this type of housing need. Some local authorities have specific targets in place regarding the provision of wheelchair housing, Glasgow City Council, for example, in its strategic housing investment plan, says, uh, states um, and requires all housing developments of over 20 units or over to deliver 10% of units as readily adaptable and should ensure that the housing stock across the city becomes more accessible. Inverclyde local housing strategy states that there should be a target of 3% of all new build social housing to be wheelchair accessible. Uh, there may be other authorities, but it's clear to me that it is not wide enough, and we know we have a democratic, demographic issue uh, with older people and the need for dementia-friendly housing. I just want to see what the amendments actually do. Um, so Amendment uh, 222 and 223 are similar models, but what they do is that they require the local development plan to include a summary of action, an analysis of how the design was helped to meet the needs of disabled people, an estimate of the new housing, and an estimate of existing homes which could be adapted um, to make them more accessible. And subsection 2A defines accessible design to take into account um, the needs of um, uh, mental health needs in particular. Um, Amendment 223 um, addresses the question of dementia-friendly housing. I think it's worth noting that there are no national targets for housing for older people. Um, I'm if there are, I'm certainly not aware of this, and I checked this with Spice. The Scottish Government published a refresh of its strategy for housing for older people in August 2018, but there's no mention of any targets for older people, and we know this is an issue that does need to be addressed. The structure of the Amendment 223 is a similar model. It requires a summary of action and analysis of how design um, has helped to meet the needs, an estimate of the existing house, housing, which will be adapted using age and dementia-friendly design, and subsection 2A 
uh, aid and dementia friendly design means that it should take into account the needs, including the mental health and the well-being needs of older people in the construction and the adaption of housing. I hope the committee could support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pauline. Uh, Jeremy Balfour to speak to Amendment 52 and other amendments in the group. Uh, good morning, convener, and, and thank you. Um, can I uh, talk briefly around Amendment uh, 52? Um, I think it uh, builds on what we've already heard um, from previous members, uh, but uh, this amendment goes maybe just slightly for, uh, further in that it stipulates that local authorities will be required to earmark sufficient and appropriate sites to help reduce the current chronic shortfall of suitable properties available for those who are older and with uh, disabilities. Um, can I um, agree with Paul McNeil and also answer maybe the Minister's point is that this is not the only thing that will solve the issue, uh, but I think it is a very important step to have it on the face of the bill. Um, maybe to pick up a point that Annabelle Ewan has made uh, previously in regard to why are we uh, picking out disability and older people. And I think the reason for that is that is the type of housing that is required is different from perhaps people who are veterans or who are, are single parents. Um, I heard a, an, an almost tragic tale recently um, in another part of Scotland, not in Edinburgh, where um, after building a number of houses, they realised that we needed to put two disabled uh, flats in and they basically had to redesign the whole flat, uh, take everything out and do it again because no one had thought about it at an earlier stage. Uh, that, that just is not the way that we should be going at the moment. And I think often when we think of disability, we think of uh, wheelchairs, which um, Polly McNeil has um, talked about already. But disability goes beyond just those uh, who have wheelchair access. Um, design of houses um, must accommodate people with different types of disability, whether that is hidden or whether that is very obvious. And I think we need to be thinking at an early stage in regard to that. Clearly, older people's housing and disability housing can often, because of the adaptations that are required, be more expensive. And so when uh, a piece of land comes up, um, it may well go to just general housing or retail or office development um, be because simply of the cost factors. And unless there is um, stipulated within this, um, I feel that, that will go on. The other uh, benefit of doing this is that it will release um, housing sectors. So if older people have more appropriate homes that they can move into at an older age, they may well then be able to give up the traditional family home, which will then put it onto the market and allow perhaps up to 33 billion worth of homes um, onto a knock-on effect in regard to an economic boost in my area. Um, I think this is a, an, an important signal. I think it's an important obligation on local authorities. And I think unless we start addressing the issues around disability and older people, we are going to face uh, major problems um, in the years ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, I'm going to ask Rhoda Grant to speak to Amendment 224, other amendments in the group, including, I believe you're going to speak on behalf of Claire Baker for Amendment 82, Rhoda. Hey, thank you, Convener. Um, I'll firstly speak to my Amendment 224, and I won't rehearse the arguments I made last week about the importance of repopulation and resettlement. Um, this Amendment 224 is the same as 217 um, on, that was uh, debated and moved last week and indeed um, passed by the Committee on the National Planning Framework. This one relates to the local development plan and it refers to the desirability of allocating land for the purpose of resettlement. And this would make that one of the matters um, to be considered in the preparation of the local de development plans. If I can move to Amendment 82 in the name of Claire Baker, and it's very similar in that it complements Amendment 71 that was agreed to last week in the National Planning Framework as well. It adds cultural to the list of characteristics to be considered in local development plans, recognising the importance of cultural assets and acknowledging their importance in decision making. Thank you very much, Rhoda. Uh, Alexander Stewart to speak to Amendment 54 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. This amendment will ensure that the evidence reports which planning authorities will have to prepare must consider older people's housing needs. Now, in the report, it indicates that the planning authority are to submit the evidence reports for Scottish ministers who will then uh, appoint 
a person to assess that the reports contains enough information for planning authorities to, for people and individuals of older nature. The amendment will ensure that the evidence reports consider the housing needs of older people. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much. Uh, Alistair Allen to speak to Amendment 191 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, as I mentioned last week, I've been working with Community Land Scotland um, around amendments which uh, uh, would uh, promote uh, the, uh, the um, needs of, of uh, parts of Scotland which have become depopulated. Uh, and to encourage their repopulation. Uh, the amendments I'm talking about today have the same theme. Uh, I was uh, gratified last week that the committee supported unanimously, I think, uh, the ideas which uh, myself and others were putting forward around this, even if the, the section of the bill or the amendment of the bill that, were, that was being sought to be amended uh, didn't survive uh, the, that, uh, that meeting. I should say that um, the amendment uh, 191 uh, isn't dependent in any way on the arguments for or against 116. Amendment 191 amends section 15.5 of the 1997 Act so that planning authorities will have to take into account rural areas where there has been a substantial decline in population uh, when they prepare the local development plan spatial strategy. Amendment 192 cross-references the provisions of 191 with the regulations that ministers would have the power to make. Uh, and I hope um, that both uh, amendments will, will gain support on those grounds. Thank you very much, Alistair. Uh, Minister, to speak to Amendment 117 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, there are many amendments in this group, and I'll try and uh, keep my comments as brief as possible. Um, I've listened carefully whilst members have spoken about a wide range of matters uh, for local development plans to address. And I'm not entirely convinced that everything that's been put forward is a matter for a local development plan to address. Um, planning touches on so many areas that this part of the bill could be endless if we tried to name everything that local development plans should cover. Some of the amendments relate to policies that already exist in Scottish planning policy, which the committee has agreed should be incorporated into the national planning framework. And last week, I reminded the committee uh, that we're trying to streamline the system. Uh, and I'll make that point again today. I would also ask the members to bear in mind that primary legislation should ideally avoid listing every relevant planning policy or issue. Uh, following my comments last week, I'm happy to support Amendment 225 from Claudia Beamish on renewable energy, uh, Amendment 163 from John Finney on disused railways, and Amendment 82 from Claire Baker on culture. On the issue of repopulating rural areas, I support Alistair Allen's Amendments 191 and 192, uh, but I maintain my view that Rhoda Grant's Amendment 224 on this issue uh, goes too far. I also explained last week that uh, assessments relating to gender equality um, are more fully covered by the duties that I've talked about earlier today as well, the Equality Act 2010, and the existing Equality Duty in the 1997 Act, so I cannot support Amendments 86 and 86A. Health impact assessment is including, included in strategic environmental assessment, so I do not support Amendments 107, 110 and 111. In relation to Amendment 108, I agree that development planning should take into account the capacity of health services. Um, I believe that this would fit more appropriately in subsection D of section 15 that relates to infrastructure, uh, but I'm content to support that amendment. Again, I find it difficult to support the breadth of Amendment 109. Planning authorities cannot be expected to identify and address all of the health needs of the population uh, of their areas. I am, however, able to support the more appropriate approach in Amendment 110. There are eight amendments from different members that seek to ensure that the housing needs of older people and disabled people are appropriately reflected in local development plans. I've ex previously explained that a lot of work is already being done on this and that it is well covered by policy and practice as well as the programme for government. It is clear from the amendments that there are different views on how this issue should be addressed in local development plans and we cannot fully prescribe how this complex issue should be addressed in primary legislation. 
I agree this is an important matter now and will be even more so in the future, but we cannot reasonably include all of these amendments as there is a degree of duplication and overlap. I would therefore suggest that Amendment 54 from Alexander Stewart with Amendment 54A from Kenneth Gibson would be the best way of ensuring that the legislation reflects this issue without attempting to cover it to an inappropriate level of detail. I would ask uh, the committee to support these in amend amendments and reject the others relating to this, to this matter. I should also say that at this moment, um, convener, a lot of the issues that have been talked about today um, are uh, being looked at in a refreshed local housing strategy. And they, that is the best place to consider the needs of individuals in relation to age or disability. Um, we cannot assess uh, uh, how existing homes meet the needs of their occupants at a strategic level. And adaptations, as I said earlier, which are the responsibility of health and social care partnerships, don't very often require planning permission. Um, so I would ask members to uh, agree 54 from Alexander Stewart with Amendment 54A from Kenneth Gibson. Um, I'll not dwell on Amendments 36 and 37 from Graham Simpson uh, relating to housing and education. I would ask the committee not to support them and instead to agree Amendment 117 in my name. The wording of Amendment 117 better reflects established planning terminology in relation to housing and I consider that education facilities should be identified as an essential type of infrastructure rather than the more broadly termed Amendment 37 from Graham Simpson. I would be happy to work with Mona, Monica Lennon to add health services um, there too. In Amendment 35, Graham Simpson proposes adding a requirement for local development plans to set out a list for self-built housing sites in, in that amendment. Uh, diversifying housing delivery was supported by the independent review uh, panel and we have since undertaken a programme of work to support and promote self and custom build in, here in Scotland. This includes a £160,000 challenge fund pi for pilot projects and we have launched a national £4 million self-build loan fund to support self-builders who are unable to access standard bank lending. I have some concerns about how this fits with current practice on allocating sites and local development plans, so some adjustment may be needed. But I support the principle and I'm happy to support this uh, amendment. Uh, turning to Amendment 176 on open space, again I recognise that this is an important policy issue, however I have already set out my thoughts on Amendment 171. These thoughts also apply here, so I do not support this. In Amendment 34, um, Graham Simpson seeks to introduce a presumption in favour of developing brownfield land before any land designated as Greenbelt is, land is developed. It includes a requirement for planning authorities to maintain a register of brownfield land which is suitable for res residential use, although the presumption would not be limited to residential use. I agree with the broad sentiments behind this amend amendment. This is not a new idea, uh, but a classic uh, town planning debate that has gone on for some time. But I have a number of significant concerns. I do not support the introduction introduction of a blanket presumption uh, in favour or indeed against any particular type of a de development in a particular location. This does not allow for local circumstances and the merits of each case to be taken into account. Brownfield sites share characteristics but they are not all the same. Um, whether they are suitable or viable uh, for development depends on a range of factors including neighbouring and compatible uses and their proximity to infrastructure like public transport, schools and health facilities. Brownfield sites can offer temporary or permanent greening opportunities within towns and cities, while equally there can be brownfield sites in the green belt, such as abandoned agricultural buildings which would do well to be redeveloped. It's not such a clear-cut issue as uh, Mr Simpson's uh, amendment would suggest. Uh, this amendment could have a significant impact on the viability of residential development 
and the number of homes that can be delivered. It removes the discretion and local knowledge that planning authorities can use to direct the right development to the right place. A standardised approach to the question of planning for housing and protection of the Green Belt is not, in my view, the right solution. Several amendments relate to built heritage. I have no objection. I'll finish this, I'll, I'll finish this part first, Mr Simpson. Several amendments relate to built heritage. I have no objection to Graham Simpson's Amendment 73, and I agree that this is an important part of the quality, distinctiveness and identity of our many places and that it would be useful to highlight. And I'll take Mr Simpson in now, convener. Um, thank, thanks very much. Uh, so just going back to uh, brownfield sites, um, I, I completely take on board uh, what the Minister said, uh, and I said in my opening remarks, I'd, I didn't think this was uh, the finished article by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so can the Minister indicate if he's prepared to work with me on something for stage three, and I will not press it? I will certainly um, speak to uh, Mr Simpson about this issue without making any major commitment here today. I think the, the, the problem that I have is uh, presumption uh, required in legislation is perhaps not as flexible uh, as Mr Simpson thinks it may be. Um, and it's not, certainly not as flexible as the policy approach that we already have, um, which of course will be strengthened uh, through uh, the inclusion of Scottish planning policy in the national planning framework. I'm more than happy to have further um, discussions with Mr Simpson on this um, and any other matter that he wishes. And I, I would be grateful if he did not press that uh, amendment today. Um, amendment 75 relates to Graham Simpson's proposal for a new system for protecting locally significant buildings. Um, I consider this um, unnecessary. This would create an additional statutory list of buildings which are locally significant. I'm not aware of any evidence or consultation supporting this proposal other than anecdote and a general view that more needs to be done to safeguard the built heritage. Protection and enhancement of the historic environment is already supported by existing legislation under the Planning Listed Buildings and Conservation Area Scotland Act 1997. This enables buildings to be listed according to their relative importance, A, B or C, all categories have the same level of protection and C listing includes buildings of local importance. It is difficult to estimate how many buildings would be included. I believe that there are around 47,500 listed buildings in Scotland at the moment. A new list uh, could be a major undertaking if it seeks to pick up additional, less significant buildings that have a purely local value. This will clearly be a substantial additional activity and burden for local authorities. Similarly, Andy Whiteman would require local development plans to include policies and proposals for the use of listed buildings. This is already addressed in Scottish planning policy and covered in local development plans, and I see no need to repeat that policy in primary legislation. Alison Johnson proposes uh, amendments relating to provision of public conveniences and water refill stations. Um, of course, I recognise the importance of public conveniences, and it's very welcome um, that great progress is being made uh, towards reducing waste and ensuring taps are available for refilling water bo bottles. However, I would urge the committee to consider whether this is really a matter for planning authorities um, and local development plans to address. As Ms Johnson rightly hi highlighted in her speech, um, we are talking about policy areas that could be pursued uh, by local authorities using other means. Community access scheme policies, as um, Ms uh, Johnson highlighted, um, are great things, but quite frankly, they have nothing to do with planning. Um, and I do hope... I, I will, from Ms Johnson, yeah. Um, thank you, convener. Um, I appreciate everything the, the Minister has said with regards to streamlining legislation. Um, I personally loathe clutter and I'm all for streamlining. But I think we can at times take streamlining too far. Um, access to sanitation and water remain the most off track of all Millennium Development Goals. Now, that's at a global level. 
But here in this country, it is clear that more and more people are experiencing difficulty going to the toilet. Because, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Minister, um, I just think this is a really good opportunity to stress the importance of these two issues, which we all we all need for survival. To be, um, to be blunt, convener, um, I recognise all that Alison Johnson has said in that regard, but I would argue um, that planning does not, particularly local development planning. Um, is not the place to deal with these issues. I think um, what we are talking about in terms of local development planning um, is dealing um, with large areas and what will or will not be um, built on them. I think the problem that there is in terms... Uh, with all of this, who, who was asking for that? Uh, I'll take my shoe in, yeah. Yes, it was just to say, and I, and I find Alison Johnson's uh, remarks really interesting and many important points were raised and indeed uh, Alison Johnson has just reiterated that she, she's keen that the importance of these issues is stress and, and I would agree with that. I do though tend to agree with the Minister that I'm not entirely sure the planning bill is the place for this to happen. What I would ask the minister is, would he be uh, prepared, having you know heard the, the seriousness with which these issues have been raised and supported, I suspect, by, by members around the, the, the table today, would he undertake to raise these issues uh, uh, in his uh, normal dialogue with COSLA so that we can see the improvements that Alison Johnson is wishing to see? I, I'm more than happy to do that. My dialogue with uh, COSLA uh, covers many areas and uh, I'm uh, more than happy uh, to bring up these issues with COSLA. Um, I think um, I'll, I'll take Ms McNeil if before. Thank you. Is that okay? It's very small. No, this is the last I just wondered then, this. perhaps, if you wanted to build a large department store in Glasgow and you wanted to create a duty for local authorities to build public, I just wonder where would be the appropriate place to do it if it's not in a planning bill? I'm, I'm willing to be open-minded about that. Um, well, I, I think, you know, in terms of uh, any planning application, each local authority um, can look at what the situation is and make requirements around about building. There is a, a, a further amendment at a later stage um, from Mr Balfour, um, which I think is a, a, a very wise um, a, a amendment, uh, which we will deal with at a later point, where it sets out a, a particular thing for a particular um, situation in terms of the size and all of the rest of the building. That is a wise thing. What is very difficult is to encompass all of this in local development plan policy. And I would say that the difficulty that we have is not necessarily about um, what is coming. It is a, often a matter of how existing facilities are used um, and choices that are made um, by uh, local authorities and others. I think, I think I've, uh, I've covered all gamuts in this, so I, I would not be supportive of those amendments, but I am happy to have further discussions with Alan, Alison Johnson. If anybody we wants to make an to, intervention, can you please do it through the convener? We need to be realistic about what development plans can achieve. Um, and as has been pointed out throughout, um, we do want to streamli streamline the system and be better able to move ahead with delivering needed development, including uh, policies on such detailed matters within local development plans, does not sit comfortably in a new system which should be less bogged down, if you excuse the pun in detail, uh, and more focused on the bigger picture. Finally, um, Graham Simpson... Simpson proposes that local development plans must be consistent with the national planning framework rather than taking it into account. This may appear to be a minor difference, but the two different forms of wording could have a very different effect in practice. I consider this could have significant implications for the development plan system as a whole. I believe this amendment has been inspired by Homes for Scotland, who want to see consistency within the system. However, I believe that they also want planning to respond to changing circumstances. There may well be good reasons for flexibility. Specific local circumstances may justify a more tailored local approach or more up-to-date information could emerge from land audits after the national planning framework has been adopted. This requirement for consistency has caused significant problems in the existing planning system. 
Local development plans that come forward late have to be consistent with housing targets set in a strategic development plans set out in strategic development plans years earlier and cannot take into account more recent evidence. We want plans to reflect the best available information rather than slavishly following a fixed and out of date hierarchy. If the wording of the bill requires consistency, local development plans would, in every case, be expected to simply incorporate the national planning framework without being able to question or adjust it. We consider the requirement to take account of maintains the connection, but allows for greater flexibility where there is an evidence reason for it. I'm a bit surprised at this amendment, given Mr Simpson's concerns about centralisation, and I hope that the committee will not support it. To conclude, I agree some matters are of such strategic importance that they should be explicit, explicitly required in local development plans. However, some of these amendments go too far towards setting out policy in primary legislation or address relatively narrow issues and risk that authorities will focus on this uh, mixed bag of statutory requirements at the expense of more coherent planning policy. To conclude, um, and at the risk of repeating myself, convener, I would ask the committee to bear in mind that we are seeking to simplify and streamline the system rather than making it more complicated and unwieldy. Some of these amendments introduce significant new requirements at a time when local authority planning services are already very stretched. I hope that the committee will reflect on that and be clear that new duties are necessary, if, the, if these new duties are necessary, and really add value um, before they support them. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much, Minister. I'll now ask Claudia Beamish to speak to Amendment 225 and other amendments in the group. Right. Thank you, convener. Um, I, I wish to speak to my Amendment 225, which follows on from my earlier Amendment 218, uh, which was passed by the committee last week and sought to include the provision of information on renewable energy land available to assist Scottish ministers in preparing the national, perform national planning framework. I welcome the minister's support for um, Amendment 225, and I'm not going to rehearse all the arguments again, but just um, extremely briefly, um, it is important that it's recognised in local development plans um, that renewable energy is something that's to be taken clearly into account. And, uh, and my amendment adds a specific opportunity for, for this to happen, um, to be added to um, uh, energy um, in, in the list of, uh, sorry, of the infrastructure of a district. Um, in our shift to um, zero carbon to conclude, we need a, to seriously focus on climate friendly infrastructure options and I'm delighted that the Minister is supporting, and I hope that the committee will consider doing so too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Monica Lennon wants to come in briefly because she has a good idea. She says it's a helpful suggestion. Sorry. It was just a humble suggestion on Alison Johnson's 161, because I do believe Alison has raised a really, really important um, issue. If I could recommend some, some reading to, to the Minister, um, I'm sure your officials will be familiar with the work of Professor Clara Greed, who's an eminent uh, planning academic, and she has written extensively on the subject of gender, but on toilets. Uh, she is globally renowned on this subject. Um, it's not a peripheral issue. It is a matter for planning authorities, and I think uh, that Alison's uh, amendment would, um, you know, Phil, I was going to say plug a gap, we're going into too many yeah, puns yeah. here, but I think if the Minister takes a look at that, you don't need to take our words for it, Clara Greed is the woman you need to listen to. And the Minister can make up his own mind how helpful that suggestion was, thank you. Uh, okay, I now ask Andy Whiteman to wind up on Amendment 86. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. I'll keep this um, quite brief. Um, I think actually the debate around Amendments 161 and 162 kind of crystallised some of the issues here. Um, I mean, the Minister said that he disagrees that local development plans are the place. And I think it was Pauline Neill who said, well, if they're not the place, where is the place? Local development plans are, are an opportunity, are the place that um, planning authorities set out their views on the spatial uh, allocation um, of land and development uh, in their area. Uh, 
by placing a duty on them to include a statement. A statement may be a sentence, a statement may be 10 pages. Um, about the provision of public conveniences and water refill uh, points, this could, for example, and I just merely threw this as, as an example, um, uh, uh, contain a statement to the effect that all new development of a certain type shall be, uh, shall include, or shall uh, um, um, uh, consider including uh, the provision of public conveniences and water refill points, particularly, for example, developments that create new public spaces. Um, or developments that take the place of older developments that give us the opportunity to upgrade. So, I mean, I think this is the... Just, I, I will in a second. I think this is the place for planning authorities to express a view, to make a statement as to their view as to how we could increase the availability of public conveniences and water refill points. Of course, it's not about implementation, uh, but it can contain a statement that would be helpful to guide developers and guide the owners of land uh, in knowing that in bringing forward certain kinds of development, there will be an expectation that these things be done. I'm happy to con give I, I think one of the things about the statement is that there will be an expectation from folk out there that this statement will automatically lead to this, that and the other. Um, and that is not what this does at all. And I think, you know, again, um, I would refer back to uh, an amendment that we're going to deal with at a, at a later point, where Mr Balfour um, state, sets out very clearly in an amendment how to bring forward changing places, toilets, uh, and bring them into um, play. I'm willing to have um, uh, further discussions uh, with Ms. Ms Johnson around about this issue, but I don't think um, that having a statement in the local development plan is necessarily um, the way to deal with this, and it certainly would not provide the solution um, that many folks out there uh, would like to see. I thank the Minister for the intervention. I think if the public expect this statement to deliver the kind of changes that some of them may regard, then that expectation is misplaced. That does not mean to say that it should not be contained in a statement. A statement provides an opportunity for people to take a considered view as to whether indeed there is anything the planning system could do to improve the provision of these two things. They may well take the view that there's nothing they can do, and the statement will be made to that effect. Um, and it is not the planning system, as the minister says. Of course, it's not a solution. If a planning, if a local authority are closing all their public conveniences, uh, it's still open to them to have a planning statement that says we need them, and these are the kind of circumstances in which they could be provided. So I fundamentally disagree, um, and that's why I think that one six one two kind of crystallise a lot of the debates we're having. Now, just to conclude. Um, for example, Pauline Neill's Amendment 222, Jeremy Balfour's Amendment 552, do, uh, uh, are illustrations of the extent to which there is a wide range of interest in Parliament on a number of topics which we feel should be given greater focus and greater attention in local development plans. I agree with the Minister when he says that there will be overlap and duplication. I absolutely agree with that. It's very difficult, I have to say, following the Minister's statement about which amendments he deems useful to support and, and not support, um, to, 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 to perhaps eliminate all that overlap and duplication here at Stage 2. There will be duplication and overlap. And I, as a member of this committee, and I hope other members uh, would agree, all have an obligation to make sure this bill makes sense. And I think it's patently clear uh, that where there are overlaps and duplications, but there's clear political will, to improve the way in which local development plans make statements, make, make, uh, uh, t take, take views on matters to do with older people or water refill points. Um, the, at, before stage two, we all make the effort to make sure that these duplications are taken away and the statements are clear, they're concise and they're proportionate. And I personally uh, would uh, support that. And as I say, I hope other members would as well. And I hope that gives the minister some comfort um, that some of the things that are being proposed are not the final article, but are uh, uh, um, our intentions uh, to improve uh, the planning bill, um, but that further work needs to be done. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, much. Uh, Monica Lennon, to wind up on Amendment 86A. Uh, thank you, um, convener. Um, I don't think I'd really get much more to add to that. I think um, in terms of the need to uh, embed uh, equality into our planning assessments, I think I've made that point um, extensively. I know we don't have a consensus yet, but um, I'll keep working on that.
Thank you. Okay, thank you. And can I ask you, are you going to press or we'll drop? I'm going to press. Yeah. Thank you. In that case, then, the question is, Amendment 86A be agreed to? Are we all agreed? No, yes. Uh, those in favour? Those against? Okay, you got that. The amendment falls. Uh, Andy Whiteman to press or withdraw Amendment 86? Yes, I'm pressing that. Yeah, I was going to ask Annabelle if she wanted to do it for you there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, that's just who you are, Annabelle. Uh, the question is that Amendment 86 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, those in favour? And those opposed? Okay. And therefore the amendment falls. I call Amendment 107 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 86. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 107 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Those opposed? Four, three in favour. The amendment is agreed. Call Amendment 172 in the name of Kenneth Gibson, already debated with Amendment 86. Kenneth Gibson to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 172 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? Those opposed? Uh, the amendment is therefore agreed 5-2. Yeah. Okay, I call amendment 34 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with amendment 86. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. Uh, I call amendment 161 in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated with amendment 86. Alison Johnson to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 161 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. Those in favour? And those opposed? The amendment's agreed. I call Amendment 162 in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated with Amendment 86. Alison Johnson to move or not move? Move. Thank you. Those in favour? Uh, sorry, uh, the question is that Amendment 162 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. Those in favour? And those opposed? The amendment 162 is agreed to. Yep. Okay. I call amendment 173 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with amendment 86. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call amendment 222 in the name of Paulie McNeil, already debated with amendment 86. Paulie McNeil to move or not move? move? The question is that Amendment 222 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. Those in favour of and those opposed? The amendment is therefore agreed to. I call Amendment 223 in the name of Pauline McNeil. Already debated with Amendment 86. Moved. Pauline jumping the gun there. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the question is that Amendment 223 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. Those in favour? And those opposed? The amendment is therefore agreed to. Okay. I call amendment 163 in the name of John Finney, already debated with amendment 86. Andy Whiteman to move or not move? And I'm hand. moved on behalf of John Finney. Thank you, Andy. Uh, the question is, is that amendment 163 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, the amendment is therefore agreed to. I call Amendment 35 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 86. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Moved. The question is, that Amendment 35 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. No. Okay, those in favour of Amendment 35? Mm -hmm. oh. Sorry. Yeah, I know, you were used to that. <laughs> uh, and th those opposed? <laughs> no. <laughs> that, that's... Sort of five one one, right? Uh, <laughs> right, that's five two. Yes, yeah, so that's probably a good idea. I call amendment fifty two in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with amendment eighty six. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Move. Thank you. Uh, the question is that amendment fifty two be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No, yes. Those in favour? Those opposed? Okay, the amendment is therefore agreed to. I call amendment 174 in the name of Kenneth Gibson, already debated with amendment 86. Kenneth Gibson to move or not move? Moved. 
The question is that Amendment 174 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Those in favour? Those opposed? The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 73 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 86. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Move. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 73 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Thank you. The amendment is therefore agreed. Five, seven, zero. Call Amendment 82 in the name of Claire Baker, already debated with Amendment 86. Rhoda Grant to move on behalf of Claire Baker yes, or not? Yes, moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 82 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Thank you. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 190 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 86. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 190 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The amendment is therefore agreed. Uh, I call Amendment 36 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 86. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No, yes. Those in favour? Those opposed? The amendment is therefore agreed to. Yep. I call Amendment 224 in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 86. Rhoda Grant to move or not? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 224 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? And those opposed? Uh, the amendment is agreed. 4-3. I call Amendment 37 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 86. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 37 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour? And those opposed? The amendment falls. 3-4. Thank you. I call Amendment 54 in the name of Alexander Stewart, already debated with Amendment 86. Alexander Stewart to move or not move? Move. Thank you. I call Amendment 54A in the name of Kenneth Gibson, already debated with Amendment 86. Moved. Another gun jumper. Uh, thank you. Uh, as an amendment, the question is that Amendment 54A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Alexander to press, Alexander Stewart to press or withdraw 54? Press. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 54 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 108 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 86. Monica to move or not? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 108 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to. I call Amendment 109 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 86. Monica Lennon to move or not? Move. The question is that Amendment 109 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour of 109? And those opposed? Yeah, amendment 109 is agreed. 4-3. Okay. I call Amendment 191 in the name of Alistair Allen, already debated with Amendment 86. Alistair Allen to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 191 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 117 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 86. Minister, would you like to move it? Moved, Convener. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 117 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That's great. Thank you. The amendment is therefore agreed. Call Amendment 192 in the name of Alistair Allen, already debated with Amendment 86. Alistair Allen to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 192 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Thank you. The Amendment 192 is therefore agreed to. I call Amendment 225 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 86. Claudia Beamish to move or not move? To move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 225 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. And I am going to stop there. Do you agree? Uh, do you agree? Yeah, 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 I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 20 past now. OK, can I um, thank the Minister, his officials, and if all the other MSPs who attended today's meeting. We will continue stage two consideration of the bill next week. Any amendments up to the end of part three of the bill should be lodged with the clerks 
by noon tomorrow. And that concludes the public part of today's meeting. Thank you very much.